Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Seth Jones. I'm the Senior Vice President and Director of the International Security Program at CSIS. Uh, welcome to those both in person and those participating virtually. Uh, we have a wonderful agenda, which I'll lay out in a moment. But before we do that, I did first want to highlight the focus of our discussion this afternoon. It's on sharpening soft divides, foreign policy in an era of domestic division. And this is uh, the most recent iteration of our Global Security Forum. Let me begin just by thanking a number of people uh, that have been involved in putting all of this together. Let me start with uh, Leonardo DRS, uh, who's been a fantastic partner along the way in supporting this entire uh, project and the product that has come out of it. So thanks to Leonardo. Thanks also to Errol Yaiboke for uh, uh, the stalwart leadership in the Global Security Forum and what a wonderful team he had uh, to work with and that we had to work with, uh, led by the organizer extraordinaire for today's event, Catherine Inzuki, as well as a number of other supporters, Anastasia Strabolas, Katerina Halstead, uh, Paula Raynal, Michael Kelly, Alexis Day, and Harshana Guru. Uh, fantastic partnership and work from everybody involved. Also, thanks to the conferencing and streaming and broadcasting team uh, that is, uh, has been a great partner along the way. So the agenda today is we're going to begin with a panel uh, that's led by Emily Harding from the Center for Strategic and International Studies as the moderator. Uh, with Sue Gordon, Nancy Youssef, and Mike Green from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'll let Emily, when we get to that panel, uh, do the uh, introductions. Uh, then we'll have a keynote conversation uh, moderated by Suzanne Spaulding at CSIS, and she'll sit down with Secretaries of Defense, former Secretaries of Defense, Leon Panetta and uh, Secretary Cohen. That will be in person at CSIS. So before we begin, and I hand this over to Errol to provide an outline of GSF, I, I do want to provide a little bit of background for how we got to the subject and a little bit of the background on, G, on GSF, the Global Security Forum. It is the flagship, uh, it's the flagship conference of CSIS's international security program. Uh, and again, as we noted, uh, each year we do this in partnership with Leonardo DRS. Previous years have looked at other important issues, the role of allies and partners, emerging technologies, competition in the gray zone, and a number of other issues. In assessing subjects for this year, what we wanted to do is, is to focus on a strategically important issue. One was at the, that was at the front and center of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. national security that we believe that we could contribute to. And and just as a reminder, uh, CSIS is at its core a bipartisan, nonprofit, policy research organization dedicated to advancing practical ideas to address some of the world's greatest challenges. So based on that uh, sort of strategic overview of, of what CSIS is, that's laid out on its website, uh, we wanted again to hit an issue where, where we could deal with it in a in, in a, a way that was objective, analytical, innovative, cross-disciplinary, uh, and, and, and one that, that had impact. So what we wanted to do is, uh, in, in looking at options and looking at subjects that have been done in the past, we, we wanted to find commonalities and common interests in an era of domestic division. I mean, we can certainly see over the past several years in the United States there are examples of divisions within the U.S. Uh, we certainly saw it on and around and after January 6th. We saw it around uh, and following the protests uh, regarding the death of George Floyd. Uh, we've seen it in other ways, including around elections in the U.S. 
But there's also a very positive uh, development with the diversity across the U.S. Um, and historically, the U.S. is, was, and can be in the future strong precisely because there are differences and that we have an open democratic society. Uh, we have the opportunity to support f freedom of expression, freedom of speech. But if we look at it, we have a country that has a rich history of a diversity of political views, multiculturalism. Uh, we've had a rich tradition of letting in immigrants into the United States. We've got racial, ethnic, and gender diversity. Uh, we've got urban and rural differences. We've got differences between the coasts and in various locations in regions in the US, the Midwest, the South, uh, the Northeast, and other areas. And we also have the ability to uh, express our views openly. We've seen in the last week or two what happens in a country, in this case in Russia, where they do not have freedom of expression and freedom of speech, as we see even the departure of Western media organizations out of fear that they will be prosecuted for simply uh, explaining what is going on in the war in Ukraine. So based on, on those differences, but also what can be strengths, what we wanted to do is be constructive and to think through how to soften some of the divides that we see in the U.S. in ways that can be productive. So with that, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for what will be a wonderful set of panels. And I'm going to uh, turn this over to Errol, who will walk through some of the main findings of the report. Errol, over to you. Thanks, Seth. It's great to see so many actually shining faces as opposed to Zoom room faces. Uh, for those of you online, we hope to see you in person here at CSIS very soon. As Seth mentioned, for this year's Global Security Forum, we wanted to dig a bit deeper, especially into the challenges facing our US foreign policymakers. As we kept talking about various potential topics in said Zoom rooms, we kept asking ourselves several questions. Would that course of action that we were talking about be acceptable to the US public? Would that acceptance or not even matter? As the old political adage goes, foreign policy doesn't win elections, though it can certainly lose them. The insinuation, of course, is that voters, Americans, don't care about foreign policy unless things go wrong. But the more we dug into the topic of this year's GSF, the more we realized it was probably time to update our collective thinking on how and why Americans matter to America's foreign policy. The report we launched today is an attempt to do just that. We began the process of developing the report late last year by convening an expert workshop here at CSIS. We prioritized diversity knowing full well that DC is not exactly a representative sample of the United States of America. We put together a bipartisan group of 60 experts of many, many different disciplines, diverse not just politically and topically, but racially, geographically, and from a gender perspective. Many were not just foreign policy savvy, but leaders in their communities around the country. The November workshop featured three simultaneous scenario-based exercises. While all three scenarios were placed in the future, we tried very hard for them to be plausible, if not actually probable. The first scenario dealt with the severe disruption in the Babel Mandeb Strait. Iranian proxy Houthi militias blocked the strait, leading to a real threat of escalation in the region between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and their various allies. The blockage also throws global supply chains into disarray, causing, among other things, the price of oil to skyrocket and the usual panic buying, long lines at gas stations, and other things that tend to follow with these, these types of disruptions. The, the second scenario that you can see is one that's near and dear to my own heart and work here at CSIS with the project on fragility and mobility. It dealt with a hypothetical political turmoil situation in a couple of Central American countries, which along with climate change, 
gang violence, and other root causes leads irregular migrants to leave Honduras and El Salvador, making their way north in large numbers. The third and final scenario that our experts, including one of our panelists uh, that's going to be with us shortly, uh, dealt with Taiwan, specifically a Chinese encroachment on Taiwan's Kinmen Islands. In this hypothetical scenario, a gas pipeline explosion damages a Chinese fishing vessel. Both sides are quick to point fingers, hastily plan military exercises in the East China Sea, and are at increasing risk of direct conflict. Our diverse group of experts did not agree on the best courses of action to recommend to the president in each scenario, nor, in fact, did they agree on the degree to which public opinion even mattered in the various scenarios. Some were very certain about what needed to happen. Many others were less certain. However, almost all the experts agreed that US global leadership on the issue mattered as did appropriate consultation and messaging with the American people and with our allies around the world. But we figured that wasn't enough. We wanted to dig a little bit deeper than that even. So we not only anonymously surveyed the experts that were with us at the Global Security Forum, some of whom are here in the room with us today, it's great to see you again. We then took a very similar questionnaire and put it to the field as a public survey of voting age American adults. And as you can see, there were over 2,000 responses. Here's some of what we found. By a wide total margin, those across the political spectrum, from people who self-identified as ex extremely liberal to extremely conservative, believe that the US should be more involved in the world not less. In this answer and others, we found that partisan identification also matters less than we had perhaps expected. You all read the news about our domestic divides, the ones that Seth just talked about, probably as much if not more than we do. So this was definitely a pleasant surprise. That having been said, the public is still divided more divided than the experts we surveyed, in fact, in particular on the types of engagements they were comfortable with. Yes, the largest number of people expressed an interest in more US involvement, but those expressions of interest were not uniform across military, political, and economic lines. Put in English, the public was much more afraid of military entanglement and escalation. It's worth noting that the survey was done before Russia reinvaded Ukraine, which I'm guessing will be a hot topic of conversation in the panels to come. But given that we, what we learned throughout this process, my guess is that this fear of escalation remains, despite the outpouring of support for humanitarian, economic, and even security sector assistance to Ukraine. So after all this, what are the main policy implications from our work? First and foremost, that making US foreign policy in an era of domestic division is hard. It's really hard. We are in an increasingly connected world with scenes of death and destruction beaming directly into our Twitter and TikTok feeds. People are paying attention and they care. They come from different perspectives and life experiences. And they are divided not just by politics, but based on their socioeconomic status, age, rural versus urban location, and race. Foreign policy making today requires understanding and appreciating and incorporating these domestic divides. It also requires honest assessments of the risk tolerance of the public. Though ultimately, and this is a really, really important point, those responsible for our national security should not eliminate valuable strategic options simply because they are unpopular. Unpopular actions will sometimes be necessary, but policymakers need to clearly communicate with the public why it is important for them to take those actions, and in doing so, help shape the public narrative around unpopular decisions. There will be disagreements, 
After all, what's more American than disagreement and debate, especially around places like the Thanksgiving dinner table? But foreign policymakers should ground these debates in areas of consensus wherever they exist. For example, as I just showed, the American public is not isolationist. We believe in a strong, active, and principled United States. Well, there you go. Let's start there. My thanks go out to former superstar intern and co-author Sierra Ballard, and my deepest, deepest thanks go to Catherine Zuki, who was acknowledged before by Seth. Not only was she a great co-author, she's the brains and the heart behind this event that you have here today. It's now my honor and privilege to turn the floor over to Emily Harding, the other co-author on this report, and our incredible deputy director and senior fellow at the International Security Program here at CSIS. Please join me in welcoming Emily and the panel. All right, so with that mixed assessment of the, the pros and the cons of where we are right now, first I want to introduce our, our uh, wonderful panel today. We have Sue Gordon who is currently a consultant on technology and global risk, serving on multiple public boards. She was busy in the government. She's kept herself very busy now as well. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with her when she was the principal deputy director for national intelligence and also the deputy director of NGA, uh, and was well known within the government for her leadership and her driving forward innovation in the government. So I'm sure that, that her conversations with business leaders are also bearing fruit. Uh, we also have Nancy Youssef who is the national security correspondent with the Wall Street Journal, previously at BuzzFeed, and has covered the Middle East through all of the turmoil of the last few years, including serving as bureau chief in Cairo and also serving in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And we have Mike Green, who is the SVP for Asia, Japan chair, and Kissinger chair here at CSIS, a man of many chairs. Uh, he's the director of Asian studies at Georgetown's Walsh School as well. And he served on the NSC staff from 2001 to 2005, including as the senior director for Asia. So I'm going to be asking Mike a lot of questions about the difficulty of making foreign policy when you're trying to also communicate it to uh, the American public. So a few thoughts to, to kick us off. Uh, we find ourselves here in Washington during the Ides of March, changeable and uncertain weather for a turbulent time. 12 days ago, Russia did both the expected and the unthinkable. They started a land war in Europe. They had been telegraphing that punch for months, but many were still shocked when it actually happened. The outpouring of support from the world and across the US has been truly inspiring, but there are still those who we have seen try to use this crisis as a wedge issue. So today, once again, GSF is tackling the most difficult and most timely issues of the day. We are living a case study of unity and division in the face of a foreign policy crisis. Errol did a phenomenal job laying out the report. I really hope that you all get a, a copy of this beautiful, shiny report that we work so hard on. A few points that I want to hit on, though. Americans are not isolationists. However, they disagree deeply on how to engage in the world. We're seeing this today in Ukraine. Some people want a no-fly zone. Some people want assurances the US will limit its involvement to economic sanctions only. Second, one thing that we found in our case studies with our experts is that the initial phases of a crisis are the most conducive to unity. But then populations start to feel the sacrifice. Unity tends to fray. President Biden has already started to use the language of sacrifice with the American people. The sanctions that have been put in place on Russia are the most strenuous sanctions we have ever seen, and the knock-on effects of those sanctions are still to be felt. I don't think anybody really knows the extent to which they will reverberate across the world. So policymakers have a very treacherous pact to walk. It's not just about the best way to solve the problem, but about how to explain it to the public. Mis and disinformation complicates the picture, chipping away at our resilience and our unity. So, the challenge for policymakers, how do you make the tough foreign policy choices knowing that whatever you do, your adversaries are going to use it against you and knowing that a part of the population is going to believe fervently that you are doing it wrong? So with that as a, a starting point, um, I'm gonna go to, to Nancy first, given her role as speaking to the American public on a daily basis about developments around the world. How are you seeing these debates evolve? specifically on Ukraine, but then also what other divisive points are you seeing now and looming in the future? 
Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me. And I'm part of such an esteemed panel. I'm really excited to be here. And it's always wonderful to be able to talk to others about um, current events as we're reporting them. Um, to your question, I'll come at, at it as a storyteller because that's part of what I'm doing. And I think one of the things we're seeing out of Ukraine is a compelling story. Vladimir Zelensky is a compelling leader. The, the way that the Ukrainians have responded has really captured the international community. And I say that to say because I think it is shaping um, the discussion around how or if the U.S. should, for example, Im implement a no-fly zone. I think so many in the American public think of the United States as um, a, um, a country that can do something, that can respond to um, threats on democracy, as many see the Russian invasion on Ukraine as being. And at the same time, they see the Ukrainians responding in such a, a, um, an unbelievable and compelling way and want to do something. And, and so you'll hear, when I talk to readers, they talk about a no-fly zone and wanting to implement it. But when you get down to the mechanics of what that would mean and the risks associated with it, it leads to a very different conversation and really a confusion. I think sometimes when we talk about US response to foreign policy crisis, people will gravitate around a phrase or, or something they've heard implement in the past. But my job is to sort of just have the discussion about what the implement Implement, implications are of such a move. So for example, in, a, in the case of a no-fly zone, that would involve hundreds of aircraft, potentially with um, European allies and how you'd have to coordinate with them. There's no guarantee that Russia would abide by a no-fly zone, and now you're risking military confrontation. The US, that is to say, the American public that I hear from wants to do something. They're, 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 they're moved to do something. And yet you see the disagreements break once we talk about the mechanics of some of the things that they're talking about doing. You, you get a sense that, um, that people um, have a, a red line, and that red line is a US, US casualty death. And at the same time, the America that they know would respond to a crisis that poses such a threat not only to Ukraine, but to democracy itself. And so what I've seen in the last 12 days is a shift now from people asking, is there something the US can do versus an assumption that the US would do something? That's an interesting point. I've had the same conversations with family where it's, but we have to do something. That's right. And then it's a, well, we, we are doing some things. Um, it's just maybe we're not putting troops on the ground, maybe we aren't flying planes in the sky, but we are doing some things. Um, Sue, I wanted to ask you about these complex divisions that we're seeing within the United States. It's not just about Republican Democrat. It's not just about whether or not you vote with the red or with the blue. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated than that. Um, as you've been post-government career, mm -hmm. what kind of divisions are you seeing and how are people talking to each other? Well, what's interesting, well, I, like Nancy and Mike, I, we're grateful to be here and this is a fascinating topic. And have, at an amazing moment in history. Um, what's interesting about this moment and the topic of this is we are seeing a softening of divides because it is harder in this moment as it moves on to ascribe the event to one policy or another. Remember, we did, we did that early on, right? We eschewed the fact that it was a disrupted moment in a disruptive time, and we thought, surely it was either President Biden's fault or former T President Trump's fault that created this event. And we went to our corners, and now that you see it coming on, you see us softening to see that the this is not something we can abide, that the values that are being attacked and the ones that are being defended are the ones that we actually all hold. And so to me, the most interesting thing I see is this kind of re-recognition that at a fundamental level, all of us believe the same set of things, freedom and defense of freedom. And so, one of my hopes is that we can use this as we go forward because we will get out of this crisis. I don't know what it will look like. But this is a much bigger moment in history and it will require much bigger discussion and much harder choices. And so hopefully we can capture this small thing. So I think the divisions that existed 
so poignantly in tactical events that affected our kitchen tables, now we're more clearly able to see what's at stake and can unify around that. Yeah. Uh, Mike, I want to turn to you in just a second about making policy in this kind of environment. One thing that I want to follow up on that, Sue, though, I, I am very concerned that as sanctions really start to kick in, yep. that Americans are going to start to feel the pinch. I mean, around here, we're already seeing gas prices that are well above yep. $4 a gallon. Um, I think that some of the, the knock-on effects of, you know, Maersk not shipping yep. to Russia, all yep. of the airlines not yep. flying over Russia, um, those sanctions that prevent money from moving around the globe, they're, they're going to they're gonna start to come home. Um, I really appreciated that President Biden was starting to use that language with the American people and talk about the sacrifice, but how do you see that? Yeah, unfolding? we're in a little bit of a pinch. One of my favorite sayings is the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago or today. Yeah. <laughs> There is a lot of conversation we've been needing to have about what's happening in the world and that we have been under an illusion of ease, believing that we're all playing this great game of the law of commons where we can all take what we want as though none of our actions are affecting anything else. And we have gotten at this moment without having had all those. Had we had those, we would have able to put that in context and say, okay, we're at this moment now. The bigger thing there is a play is to make sure that no. So we didn't do that, but we're going to have to scurry to having those larger conversations about why this moment is about more than Putin invading Ukraine and more than about no fly zones and more than horribly about the lives being lost. This is not a retrenchment of a Soviet philosophy. This is a modern Russian philosophy. And so we need to start having those conversations. And neatly enough, and Nancy, I think this and you, Mike, play a huge role in this because current leaders are limited in the things that they are able to say because they're operationally involved. But you're now starting to see a lot of really good work coming out, putting this moment in that kind of context that hopefully our leaders will be able to draw on and say, yes, it will get harder, but remember, this is not about ease because this threat that is different but similar to the, the threat from China are the ones that really matter, and let's go ahead and start planting that tree for the actions we take. That's the way I'd go. Yeah, that's a great line about the plant a tree 10 years ago or today. Well, so uh, Suge was a perfect segue to our resident Asia expert. Um, Mike, can you talk a little bit about how you think think about making policy in a time when you know you have tough choices to make, but there are also the difficulties of trying to explain those tough choices on really complex subjects to a very diverse American public. Well, um, I think uh, the Biden administration has done generally very well on that front uh, after having done generally atrociously in the Afghanistan withdrawal. And you learn from your mistakes. And they have a couple of things that make that easier. Number one, um, the world's rallying. I mean, allies, I just came back from a trip to Taipei that the administration sent a group of former officials. And in Taiwan, what we heard loud and clear was this is a global uh, crisis. And China's watching, North Korea's watching. And you just assembled the most significant coalition in 70 years to deal with aggression. Uh, and it's global. And uh, so that's, that helps, because the American people want allies and they want to know, know we're not alone. And you know, in Iraq, we struggled a little bit with that. Yeah. In a way, we didn't with the Gulf War. Um, so that the, the administration has going for it, but also deserves credit, uh, Secretary Blinken in particular. Um, it also helps when the allies or the, the, the country you're trying to save is not South Vietnam, uh, but is Ukraine. And not Ukraine of 2014, but Ukraine of 2022. They're fighting, and that helps. Um, and it helps when the evil that you're standing up against is unmistakable. And uh, you mentioned earlier that part of the way our adversaries use our divisions is to exploit them and sow misinformation. It's not working. You know, the people who were standing up for Putin have gotten very quiet. You know, RT is off the air. Um, so, you know, a lot of these things will help the administration maintain public support, in my view, which is already quite high, 75 to 80 percent generally. But it will get harder because gas prices will go up. You know, there will be defections among allies. But I think they've built, a, at least for now, a good head of steam 
uh, with these other factors that historically in Vietnam and Korea and Iraq and the Gulf always mattered. And just one other comment on that one. Really good points, Mike. I think, I think the national security and the intelligence community under this administration kind of doubled down on the transparency. Yeah. So if you think about just the arc of intelligence going from secrets to supporting decision makers who may or may not be within the government, it's, it's in the last four years made this transition trying to be that voice that is trusted, funny word to be used, but so trusted and can do some prepping of the space so that when misinformation tries to seep in, the truth has already been there, right? And so I think there's been some goodness there too. The intel policy fusion is unprecedented. Right. So I mean, you and I both in the NSC, and with all respect to our friends in the IC, when the policy world wants to get a piece of information out that's critical to our national strategy, it takes weeks, months, yeah, years better. of principles committee meetings. Yeah. But in this current crisis, they are using intelligence extremely effectively. Yeah. Now, I don't know what the consequences are for intelligence well, <laughs> collection. Well, I, I hope they're doing it right. But, and I think it will change depending on where you are temporally. But I agree. It's remembering that your job isn't secrecy, but your job is national security. When the times change, you have to figure out how you apply that differently. So I think you're seeing that. So I, I wonder if it would help just to give um, the audience some sense of how the intelligence has played out for the journalists. Um, just so you get us, as you mentioned, we don't usually get told any level of detail. In the weeks leading up to the invasion, um, you had top, I'll just speak to the Pentagon, top military officials inviting us in, showing us maps, showing us with um, some level of detail on what they were seeing. They weren't revealing sources and methods, but they were and sort of, it felt like you were being invited behind the velvet rope in a way that we hadn't been in the past. At a time when people were really questioning that whether Russia would really go through with this because on one hand, while you can see everything in a way that you couldn't even during the 2003 invasion in terms of the military buildup just on open sourcing, and it was quite extraordinary, you had everyone thinking it was such an egregious act and had such, such severe consequences, certainly Russia wouldn't go through. And, and I think part of the reason that they've, the U.S. has been helped is that they were right in, in, in a way that I think um, more than others in terms of predicting this scope and scale um, of, of the invasion. And then since then, there have been sort of daily briefings in which they give a breakdown of missile strikes, um, which cities may or may not have fallen, what they can see. The challenge is um, they have less intelligence since, um, since the invasion because they don't have eyes in the sky. Um, and we've seen that one day there were, we, the reports that they were giving us were far less than others and you could, there was clouds over, um, over Ukraine and so um, you got a sense that that sort of hampered, I mean, reading tea leaves, that that, that hampered um, their ability to get intel. The other thing I would add is, because I, I think it's important, you know, this is a conventional war and something we haven't seen on this scale by the Russians in decades. We're so used to counterinsurgency wars in which the U.S. showed um, some restraint. Um, they didn't sort of go as aggressively as they could or, uh, or a, a foe like ISIS that wanted to be more aggressive but didn't have the resources to do it. We're now seeing a war in which um, the country has the capability and the will to go as aggressively as it can and that's been new. And because of that, I think the other thing we're starting to see is that the U.S. is getting more intelligence on Russia's counter or excuse me, conventional warfare in a way that they haven't been able to mm -hmm. because they've never seen it on the scale before. So those are just a couple Very points good. I wanted to add. I love that uh, line about the velvet rope, that you've been behind, invited behind the velvet <laughs> rope in a way you hadn't before. Um, as a former intelligence professional, watching them declassify and move intelligence out so quickly has been shocking and also filled me with both a sense of pride and a sense of dread. Uh, <laughs> the sense of pride is, is really about the amazing work that the intelligence community can do and does do on a daily basis. Um, and you know, I, I, they, they say that there are policy successes and intelligence failures. So it's really nice to see, to show to the American people that there are intelligence successes too. And this is an example of when we saw these things coming and they were able to discuss them. 
the sense of dread, of course, is that, oh no, those are the secrets. Uh, and they, here, they are, here they are out in the public. And there's always a downside. I mean, you, know, you say you hope they're doing it the right way. Mm. We, we all hope that they're doing it in a way that protects as many sources and methods as possible. And for the ones you can't protect, that it actually, um, you find ways to mitigate. Yeah. Yeah. I do hope that this is an opportunity for the American people to maybe renew a little trust in government, in seeing that you know, the intelligence services are doing their job well and properly, and that the government is using that information responsibly. Uh, but on this point of, of trust in government, um, what have you all seen as far as what works to improve trust in government? What do you think the U.S. government should be doing to try to improve that trust relationship with the American people? Sue, you want to go? Sure. Um, it's a nice, easy question, you know. Okay, we need government. Do we all agree? Yes. Right, we need government. Um, do we think our government is as modernly relevant as it needs to be? No, right? It's, it's, it's slow. It was, it was designed in a different time. These are policies and procedures that are in place to make sure that government is fair and equitable and transparent. But, but it, as I say, this is a really different world. It's one that we don't talk about enough. Again, it was really fun under the former president to believe that we just had a disruptor, but we had a disruptor during a disrupted time. And we need our government to respond to how the disrupted world works and be good at government in that, in that sense. So one is it does not do anyone justice to suggest that the government is malfeasant. Right? It's not my experience that it is, even when it's not good. So one, cool that thought. Second, put leaders in place that are good enough as leaders of big systems to make effect the changes that they need to. Three, I love this country. I love what our founders envisioned. I love that we have two parties. I love that we have different views on how we should approach different problems. But something has happened where every person is in government is on one party or another simply because we have political appointees. Quit moving all government leaders out every time you have a new administration come in because most are apolitical, except when they sit in the voting booth. And then the last thing is, this is a tr transparent time. Any government institution that says anything, it better be true. There just isn't no, there isn't a trust me from the government. So those sets of things will be on our way. It's easy, no problem. Easy. <laughs> check, yeah, check, check. Wouldn't it be fun? Yeah. It's <laughs> it just, it's, a, it's, it's so amazing. I, I just, and then the last is, we need to talk more about what government institutions, particularly national security institutions, do. If we talked more about it, there isn't a young person in school that wouldn't want to be part of this, at least at some point in their career. This is not stodgy bureaucracy. This is, this is protecting America and her interests in the most foundational way. Yep. Whenever I talk to people about uh, working for the intelligence community, I try to communicate that you cannot match the mission. You cannot. And then also just the cool stuff that you're frankly not allowed to do anywhere else. But, but you do have to move it along. And, and you were talking about, about sharing information differently and sharing what had been classified because the moment demands it. So that's what I mean. Bureaucracies can get stodgy. You cannot be stodgy in order to be relevant. Right. Where there's a will, there's a waiver. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm off my soapbox now. You better ask somebody else. <laughs> See, the thing is, I, I heartily endorse your soapbox, so <laughs> you can get back on it in just a second. Uh, Mike, do you want to add anything about trust in government? Well, this is a problem for government. It's a problem for um, think tanks. It's a problem for corporations. It's a problem for the bi-coastal elite. And um, I've been at CSI as long as you, and you have, um, Emily, but we've had, we had you know, deep, deep debates. What do we do after 2016, after Brexit, all that? Um, we talked about getting in buses and driving around the country teaching foreign policy, and silly things like that. You know what we did? More data. 
Mm -hmm. uh, AMTI, more over at imagery. Mm -hmm. Uh, the stuff security studies has done on this yeah. Ukraine crisis, more, more facts. It turns out people like facts, they like data. They're still gonna get their favorite news feed for opinions, but facts are stubborn things and powerful things. And I, I, I suspect that at some level, the speed with which the intelligence community declassified imagery and other things this time, I think, had a lot to do with the marketplace changing overall. Oh, because totally people can get stuff from the New York Times, totally the Washington agree. Post, or CSIS that... Or the Wall Street Journal. Or, well, sometimes the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the kind of imagery yeah. that at one earlier points in our career would have been highly yeah. restricted. Yeah. And you can now buy it commercially. Totally. A think tank or a university can. So I, I think it, it, the marketplace has changed, and in some ways, government's figuring that out. Think tanks were a little faster, maybe. That matters a lot. Um, the other thing is bipartisanship. It's not dead in this town. It, 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 you know, we, uh, we have meetings on China all the time with members from both parties. And when the cameras are off, it's near total unanimity on what we've got to do. And um, uh, the, the administration would be wise to convene you know, leaders in Congress constantly in this crisis, sharing intel, sharing ideas, hearing them out. There will be some outliers who will play for the bleachers. That's inevitable, especially yeah. now. But the bipartisanship is possible. It, it's, it's, it's been true for China for a while, and I think it could be true now in this Ukraine case. Um, and you know, so government, it's not a problem for government officials, but political appointees have got to fight partisan instincts yep. and reach across the aisle in times like this. Yeah, you're right about bipartisanship not being dead. I had the privilege of working on the Senate Intelligence Committee, which was this wonderful island of, of really deep bipartisanship. And part of, I think, what created that magic was that we were all sitting in the same office space. We were all sitting in the same room. You bump into your Republican or Democratic colleagues in the kitchen while you're heating up your lunch. You bump into them at 10 p.m. when you're all trying to get ready for the hearing the next day. Um, and then a lot of the discussions that happened among the members happened behind closed doors where there was no posturing for the cameras and they could really just dig in on very difficult foreign policy issues. Yeah. Nancy, did you want to add anything here? No, I mean, the only thing I would add is I think one reason there was some um, doubt about the U.S. claims, even though we could all see an incredible, massive um, military buildup around Ukraine, is I do think Afghanistan was a factor. Oh. And, and, and be, the way Afghanistan and the way information was put forth, um, I think was a contributing factor. And I also think it's a factor in when, when you hear Americans saying, let's do more. Yeah, I think for some people, the way Afghanistan ended it is it really crushed American perception, not only internally, but externally, about the ability of the United States military and what it could and couldn't do. And sometimes I'll hear from readers, I think that the scar of that is such that they want Ukraine to be, in some ways, an opportunity for the U.S. to reassert itself as the leader of, of, of the defenders of democracy mm -hmm. at a time when, when you see everyday Ukrainians fighting so gallantly um, against the, the, the potential collapse of their democratic system. I think that's very true. Um, I don't know, Mike. I kind of like the idea of getting on buses and driving across the country. It would be like the nerdiest party bus in the world, but we could have so much fun with it. We have crowds of two and three. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so on that point about you know, using open source intelligence and the vast amount of information that's, that's out there in the world, there is this moment right now where this is really the first open source war. Anything you want to know exists out there, whether it's true or not. So we're in this moment where there's a huge amount of information. A lot of it's credible. There's also a huge amount of mis- and disinformation. A lot of it is not credible. And you see people trying to sort through their Twitter feeds, and it's so easy, it's so easy to just keep the doom scrolling and not stop and think for a second about whether this thing that I just absorbed is true or real, uh, or whether you know, it's credibly sourced, or whether it's just somebody pushing an agenda. So Nancy, I want to turn to you to talk a little bit about mis- and disinformation and the way that you as a journalist try to work through what is true, what is real, and then how to talk about that to your readers in this world where there's so much pressure to be first and there's so much pressure to just get it out there before you know for sure that it's true. So, you know, the, the thing with Twitter is nobody's going on there to have a calm discourse, right? Everybody who's posting is outraged or there's some emotion. So it's just, um, it's a challenge because you'll have readers, editors seeing something and expecting you to react and post something or, re or confirm it or whatnot. And so, 
um, what you're advocating for is time. Um, you know, one, one place where I thought we saw this was last week when the nuclear power plant was struck. Mm -hmm. And, it, and in a, we were living in a world where is radioactive material being released? It was sort of a question dangling over Twitter. And you're trying journalistically to confirm it. In my case, um, through the military, but everyone is trying to confirm it, even though nobody could get to the site and make any assessment. And I think that's, that was sort of an example of where you're, you're, expe you're expected to have information, and there's no place to get it. And in real time, people are giving you their information or their perception of information as they see it. And so um, the, the other thing I would say is that readers now come to us with, because they think of social media with an expectation that we validate their point of view, particularly when there's a label on whether the, uh, somebody is liberal or conservative. I often hear from readers who are angry that I didn't present the story the way that they thought the Wall Street Journal should present it. Mm -hmm. And so there's two things. It's the need for information and the expectation that the news validate someone's point of view. Um, and so um, the way you do it is you fight for time. Um, and you try to second and third source things. And also, you sometimes have to tell readers, this is the scope of what I can tell you. I can only give you um, a 500-foot high view or a 10,000-foot view. This is as much as I know. And I found that readers appreciate when they know sort of where the boundaries are of the information that you're providing them. Um, and, and sometimes you have to be OK with not being first. So the way I've tried to do it journalistically is to not be chasing every little nugget, but to try to come up with themes or stories that are bigger that don't, don't put me on that hamster wheel of just validating something in the moment. It's not easy. And sometimes you do get things wrong. The, the last thing I'll say, something that struck me just in my time as a journalist is that you know, when I was starting out, which wasn't that long ago, or though it's starting to feel that way, you know, information was like a Fabergé egg, and it was treated delicately. And I find that with the generation of journalists under me and just people in general, information has become much more fluid and, and malleable. And, and that's affected it. So um, sometimes I feel like I put a lot of time into getting one line or one thing right, and it, and it feels very fleeting in terms of how consumers experience it. Oh, yeah, that's interesting, too. It's a lot to process there. I remember when I was on the Hill trying to convince members of my committee more often to not say something than to say something. And it was partially this phenomenon of wanting to be first. You know, you want to go out and you want to say something about it. Well, let's, let's preserve the credibility. Let's wait for just a minute and see what we can find out that's real before we actually talk about it to a reporter, for example. And that idea of, of information as a Fabergé egg, I mean, now it feels more like, you know, getting your house egged on a daily basis when people are just throwing what they think at you all the time. Um, the point about validating your own opinion, this is something that we were talking mm -hmm. about before we started, this idea that you can have a conversation with someone and you can disagree mm -hmm. without it being personal, without it being a personal mm -hmm. insult. And I feel like we've gotten away from that as a country. You know, there, there used to be this tradition of debate. There's also plenty of mudslinging, don't get me wrong. But there used to be a tradition of debate without it being a personal debate. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll answer your question, and then I yeah. just feel the need to make a comment. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons why we've lost that is uh, now there are so many sources for information that you tend to gravitate to the one that is closer to your point of view, and increasingly those offer very different fact sets. So actually, what we've created is allowing people to believe that they're seeing the truth. And if you saw that, well, this is the only opinion you could have. And if you don't have that opinion, it must be that you are not following the facts. And so we've got to do something to get back to having a common, more common fact set for which there to be really fundamental differences in how you respond to those. You know, I talk to people all the time. The question isn't whether it was a good or bad decision. It was, was it a legitimate decision? Is it a decision that someone could reasonably make that was well-grounded decision? So I think that one of the most important things, and as I say, you're starting to see, I think it's what think tanks try and do very well. It's what formers try and do when they write. They're trying to get a fact set out there that is more common, that isn't unique to just one, 
viewpoint or another. I do think what's interesting about this moment, and we were talking about intelligence, is you know there's a craft and a dis discipline to intelligence. That's what makes it intelligence. It isn't a bunch of people who have special information and just offer their opinions. There's a, there's a discipline and a craft to it. And it's a little arcane. And so when they issue forth with judgments, you, it has a foundation that you can understand. And that's because intelligence is generally about possibility. And so the craft is to allow you to deal with fundamentally uncertain information with certainty. There is a significant impedance mismatch between that process and the urgency of the moment. Right, you, you want that, can intelligence be that validated source? Yes, it can. Can it be tactically validated? That's hard for it to change as fast as it is. So I think it's really exciting to imagine more transparency in intelligence, but I think there's still a gap that needs to be crossed because it's not the same as just taking information and thinking different thoughts. Mm -hmm. I uh, believe it was the head of MI6 who just came out recently and said in order to survive, we're going to have to become more transparent. Yes. He said it better than that. But the, the idea is that uh, there was, <laughs> in, if they're going to be part of the government, if they're going to be trusted by the public, they have to be more transparent about what they do and how they do it. Yeah, because national security decision makers are in the private sector and they're the citizenry. Right? If they're the national security decision makers, because of this collected world, if they're being attacked by our adversaries and competitors through information shaping. If they're a global company who's making decisions about that, we, we're going to have to arm those people with the best information we have, but it will be sporty. So say a little bit more about that, because one of the, the phenomenon that I think will go down in history of this Ukraine conflict is the citizen sanctions that have all come into place. Right. There are government sanctions that have shown right. up, of course, central bank, that kind of thing. But, you know, as I mentioned before, Maersk pulling out, Visa and MasterCard limiting transactions, right. all kinds of airlines refusing to fly in yeah. now. So many companies that have said, we don't want to be associated with what's going on right. here. We're going to pull ourselves out regardless of what the U.S. government does. Right. And this is, this is citizens. This is, in a right. sense, public opinion right. making foreign policy. Right. And, and you love it, right? We, democracy, love, and involved populace. I will say, much like the anonymous hackers that are now doing hacking attacks, the one cautionary comment I would make is this is a big system. There are systemic effects that will happen. And so my preference is always, I love the energy, and I think it's one of the reasons why we have to get a better common sight picture is so that those actions that people can take are actions that they should take. Much like your really eloquent discussion about why you do or don't enforce a no-fly zone. So there are a lot of things they can do. So how do we get that conversation to be more robust so those actions are more mindful of the systemic effect of things that feel good? Right, I feel like a lot of them need that pep talk. You know? mm -hmm. Love your energy. Let's direct it properly. Um, <laughs> one, one of the things that I've been very impressed with what uh, Jen Easterly has done at CISA is this close partnership with the private sector, trying to really pull everybody in and have them work as a team between the government and the private sector, as opposed to the government you know, lecturing the private sector, um, pulling them behind the velvet rope a little bit and letting them know why these things are important. Um, but this, this phenomenon of you know, the citizen activism that you want to try to channel for good, I think, is really critically important. So on that note on mis- and disinformation, um, I want to talk a little bit about making the public resilient to mis- and disinformation. Uh, Suzanne uh, Spaulding will be sitting on the stage in just a little while, and she has done tremendous work on building democratic institutions and trying to create a public that is more aware of what civics is, what it means to be a citizen in a democracy. Uh, when I was working on the Russia investigation, we worked a lot on um, thinking about resilience by the public to mis- and disinformation. And we joked about this, but it was 100% true. One of our main recommendations was more funding for critical thinking classes in middle schools. For sure. Because that's where you really need to start uh, to get people thinking about the information that they're absorbing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Mike, I want to pull you into this a little bit because China is becoming more of a player in this space as well. Um, but how, how should we be thinking about creating publics, populations, 
engaged citizens who are also resilient to the mis and disinformation that spreads? Well, tonight at 7.30, I'm teaching citizenship merit badge to the Boy Scouts, so <laughs> oh, <that's wonderful. laughs> it all begins at home. Um, <laughs> look, I'm going to slightly, I don't know, challenge the premise of the question, because at least the problem I worry about most, which is strategic competition with China, I don't think we have a civics uh, or public division problem. Um, all the polls show there's a lot of unity. There didn't used to be, but now there's a lot of unity about working with our allies, competition with China. It's not, our problem, the divisions are not in that contest, the problems we have to worry about, the divisions are not in the public. And China's not effective the way Russia was effective at playing on these divisions in American society. People talk about Confucius Institutes and the United Front. I, I think it's minor league. They're just not that good at it. The divisions we have to worry about in strategic competition with China are not among the public. The divisions are between corporate America and the US government. And those are big, big divisions. And there are a lot of corporate boards that think it is crazy to, to even imagine decoupling technology mm -hmm. from China at all. <laughs> um, there are others that think we have to. There's no consensus in the business community. We did a survey a year and a half ago at CSIS of the Chamber of Commerce, of Commerce and other, and there are a lot of you know, different views. They're not monolithic, but a lot of big corporations <laughs> um, in, Northwest, in Northern California and New York um, do not want to get on side with strategic competition with China, do not want to decouple, do not want to divest, do not want to limit technology except a little bit. But at the, by the same token, there are a lot of people in the national security space who don't understand what corporations do, yeah. who don't understand profits, who don't understand you know, responsibilities to, to, to shareholders. And that's the divide, in the strategic competition with China, that's the divide we talked about when we had our group <laughs> dealing with that scenario. It wasn't divisions in the public, it was the private sector, and very sp specifically Silicon Valley and Wall Street, and the national security community, and frankly, both sides right. have got to learn about the others. Something else think tanks try to do, by the way. Mm -hmm. But that's the one, that, and those are the seams China will try to exploit in that competition. So talk a little bit more about your scenario, because your, your discussion was fascinating. I know in, I participated in the Iran Babel Mandeb scenario, and we had a very robust discussion about policy options, and then, you know, break, break, how are we going to explain this to the American people? And that was where the consensus in the room just fell apart. It got a lot more difficult to figure out how we were going to communicate what we thought was the right strategy. What, what was the, the arc of the discussion in your room? Well, I mean, there was not uh, much debate about whether a, a, a Chinese onslaught against Taiwan mattered to US national interests. Um, you know, the ends of the strategy we didn't disagree on. The ways and means got complicated, and part of, one of the areas we got tripped up on was how do we get corporate America uh, to help? And that's why this Ukraine case is so interesting as a precedent, because of what you were saying, that you have corporations now not wanting to be involved in this uh, violence. And, and the fact that you have international uh, collaboration matters because corporations here are going to see what Samsung does in Korea or Sony does in Japan or Siemens does in Germany. And if our allies are working together, it gives more room for corporations to make hard decisions in the national security space. So our discussion happened before the Ukraine crisis. I bet you it would be different today. I bet you people would feel a little bit more confident that we could form China's very different, much more intertwined in the global economy. But we would have more confidence than we did a few months ago that maybe we could form an international coalition to impose some costs. And it's not all about who sends aircraft carriers, it's about who sends exports. <laughs> um, and we're in a, it, this is what we heard in Taipei when we were there last week. We the, we, the US and the West are in a better position today. We'll see where this goes. Yeah. But we've demonstrated capabilities in our toolkit mm -hmm. that it, let's just say it's very useful that Beijing is seeing them. Yeah. Uh, as well. Yeah, definitely want to come back to that. What is China learning? Um, did you all want to add anything on the more resilient population point? Uh, I, well, uh, from my, I think you said it really well, Nancy. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Oh, see? Consensus. It does exist. There's no division in America. That's <laughs> no, a really good point. Well, so, Nancy, I want to talk to you a little bit about communicating effectively to the American people. Um, and then I definitely want to ask our panel what advice they have for the Biden administration in talking about this crisis to the American people. But first, Nancy, um, when I was at the NSC and you know in my government career, so many conversations ended with, well, the optics of that won't be good. I hate the word optics. I mean, it's one of those nails on a chalkboard words for me where you hear it and you just go, Ugh. 
But if it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do, and we'll let the chips fall where they may as far as communicating it to the public. But then we always picked up the phone and called the press secretary and said, so this is what we want to do. Can you help us figure out how to explain it? Uh, frequently, the people in the press office would curse back at us, saying, you know, can't believe you're sticking me with this big thing that I'm going to have to walk out there and explain. Um, but, you know, they, they, they are wizards at their job and learning how to communicate very well uh, what has to be done. So from your perspective as a journalist, uh, can you say a little bit about how you find, what kind of messages you find work best in your stories and with the American people? Well, let me start by saying, you know, now the press secretary, you're talking about calling the press secretary? Now the press secretary's in the room mm -hmm. of those conversations. And the thing that has struck me the most in the course of my career is as information has been sort of spread across more um, platforms, the, the messaging of the policy has become more important. You would think it would be the other way around when there were three channels and just a, a handful of sort of daily um, national newspapers, you would think it would be the other way around. But actually, as it's become more diverse, the messaging has become a much more, a bigger pie of the, of the policy puzzle, and that's been something that's really struck me. Um, so um, I'm not good at advice giving, um, but I will say, um, uh, in my experience, the, a couple things stand out. I think there's always a reticence to let the people who are actually making decisions go to the podium and talk about their policies, which I think is always unfortunate. There, you know, I'll just speak to the military. In the sort of post San McChrystal world, a lot of commanders will say, why should I go out there and risk my career um, and, give a, and give a perspective on what I've done? And I understand that. Could you say a little bit about Stan McChrystal sure, and what sorry. happened to Justin? So, um, 2010, 9, 10? Yeah, um, Stan, Stan McChrystal was the commander in Afghanistan who had spent a lot of his um, career doing special operations. Um, he and his staff took a Rolling Stone reporter with them for several months. And, and in the course of that, they said a lot of things that were less than appropriate, um, and including making references to the now president, then vice president. And it was an instance in where a general was summoned back to Washington and fired, not for the conduct of the war, but how his, how his staff talked about the war, because it said something about his management of that staff. And, 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 and it, was, it was a communications fail versus a battlefield fail. And it was really scarring for people in the United States military, because up until that point, they had been told it was better to communicate. And then we've seen a real retreat. And so now you have press secretaries talking at times when we used to see people in command. And I just think, to me, if I were to give advice, I think it's really having the people um, speak to what they've done. I'll give you an example. Um, there was the strike in Syria of the head of ISIS a few weeks ago. Seems like years ago now. But just a few weeks ago, there was the strike of the head of ISIS. And a few reporters were invited on a background with some of the people who were involved in the operation. And these were people who had spent months planning this, making the mock, um, uh, mock up of the site, who had seen these guys in real time go in. And their ability to speak to what they did. You could hear the pride in what they did. You could hear the fear in what they did. You could hear a sense of humility that just couldn't be communicated from, as much as I love spokesmen, from a spokesman. And so, in terms of communicating, the one thing I think has been lost and I think has been really detrimental is the voice from people who are actually in the room. I think press secretaries are great. I think it's great having them in the room. It's allowed us to understand things day to day a little bit better. But when big events happen, I think it's important to have that person who is part of it have a conversation and to show us that you have the confidence and this ability to not only manage that operation, but to speak about it in a way, in a responsible way. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Along with that trend line, you see, it feels like, I haven't done an actual study on this, it would be interesting, how many sources are named versus unnamed sources in the press. You have, you know, a person familiar with the situation. That's probably my, my least favorite tagline in a news article. Yeah. A person familiar with the details. Well, okay, I would hope so. I mean, again, as, as a former intelligence analyst, we had to be explicit about what our sources were. I mean, you would spend a couple lines describing, you know, a first-hand source with excellent access uh, who responds to tasking. You, you, you have a lot of uh, transparency on whether this person actually knows what they're talking about. 
So I, I hear what you're saying about how it'd be great to have more people who had been on the ground and doing the operations actually speaking about them. Um, can you do that and protect privacy? Can you do that and describe them as credible sources? So this is where my bias is going to show. I can understand wanting to protect privacy, but they are public servants. In my case, sending other people's children into harm's way, making really critical decisions. I don't know how you can show your support of your, your decision making other than to put your name behind it. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, we've, we've gotten to the point now, a lot of these senior defense officials, I should be writing people up, but I will, um, are, are people who, <laughs> who are... That alone will last forever. I know, right? <laughs> are spokesmen or, you know, people who um, are public figures. So, and I do think at times it is detrimental to the U.S. policy. I'll give you an example. When Putin and Biden had their first talk, they had, the, they had the official unofficial person, right? They have like official people designated as a senior administration official to speak about the US experience or perspective on that phone call. The Russians had their spokesman come out by name, on camera, and give the Russian version. And it gave more credibility to the Russian version of that phone call because you had a face and a name behind it. So it's not just about you know, my wanting to know, which is that's a big part of it, to be fair. But it, it actually shapes the messaging when you have somebody willing to put their name behind it and can actually affect policy. And it certainly affected perceptions of that call, so much so that the next time that there was something that happened, they had someone come out on camera. Imagine if Jake Sullivan had been a senior administration official saying that Russia could attack before the end of the Olympics and you should get out versus having a name and someone standing at the podium saying it. It, 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 it's, it's the difference between me speaking to you here and speaking with a megaphone. Right, right. right. Well, so you were in a position where you had to decide who to put in front of the cameras, who, who to let talk to a reporter. How did you think through that problem? Well, for most of, for most of my career in the intelligence community, we didn't talk to reporters. Right, that's a fireable but, offense. But, but we, no, but we <laughs> kind of figured out that evil can't succeed in the light, you know, in the light, so we've gotten better at that. Uh, I, so decision makers should always take responsibility for decisions, right? And to your point, um, uh, I, think, I think it depends on, on the seriousness of it. It depends on the gravity that you want it. You should never send somebody who, to answer questions who can't answer questions. The truth has its own sound. Someone unprepared to go in the place the conversation's going to go is going to take totally sound work and make it seem sketchy. Um, so I think, I think it's just tuning it to the moment. I think some of our most effective techniques are when we put experts off the record in front of people to have really detailed conversations so they can see that face, they can feel it, but you aren't doing it in the glare of exactly what brought us to this moment, which is a very divided public. Right. And that has to be a factor in any leader's decision making about what is going to happen to that human. My ne I, no one knew who I was until, until the moment I was no longer going to be in my position in the Trump administration. I don't know, the first time you get a LinkedIn note that says, I know where you live and I will be there tonight, you traitor. And you're like, you don't know me. There, there is a reality to that that I just think isn't. But always put someone who can speak to what they're speaking about. If it's a big decision, we're going to get to policymaker advice. That would be the one I would say is if you're going to do something hard and it's big, you're the one that's saying you're doing something hard and it's big. And you do it to the right level and uh, you take it where it is. But you have to have someone who is good enough to be able to have a conversation about the truth yeah, that's at whatever advice. level they're speaking. Yep. Um, I want to turn to Mike for advice in just a second, but it is about that time when I would invite our audience, if you have questions, to please step up to the microphone over there. Uh, we have a very talented panel and uh, look forward to, to hearing your questions. Uh, Mike, advice for you. Well, we, you know, we've talked about divides, and um, one of the divides we haven't ha talked about is the division between um, our priorities in Asia and our priorities in Europe. 
And the national security strategy and the national defense strategy were supposed to come out, what, late January yeah. or something like right. that. And uh, I wouldn't yeah. put them out either right now because you don't know quite what the world's going to be looking like. Um, but all indications were that the original drafts were going to focus on, unlike the Trump national security strategy, we're going to prioritize China. And now they're going to have to rebalance that a bit and figure that out. And there are big debates about how much we should put our strategic competition with China at risk to deal with uh, Russia and Ukraine. As an Asia expert, I say put it at risk because what happens in Ukraine is going to be fundamental to what happens next in Asia. Um, and if we get it wrong, and if you're worried about resources, we're talking about you know, U.S. deployments to NATO that are going to be big along a frontier that's much longer, um, plus the loss of credibility if we fail. So, you know, for now, we have to. Uh, if we want good Asia strategy, we have to get this right. But there's still gonna, that's still going to leave big questions about resources. So, so, so my advice to the administration is um, you need to go to the American people in the Congress. Frankly, the midterm results may make this a little bit easier. And you need to plus up defense. We have to be able to deter in both NATO and uh, the Western Pacific at the same time. And it will be somewhat easier now in the sense that we've demonstrated our ability to form global, global coalitions. That will help. Um, but you've got to spend. And, so, and that takes a message from the president. And I think, frankly, the Congress would support it <laughs> um, after November. Um, and then the other one is, uh, we haven't talked about it very much, but if you're going to maintain stability in both regions, you've got to have an economic statecraft strategy. Yeah. You've got to have. And the administration has floated this Indo-Pacific economic framework to sort of, you know, look at this to keep people busy because they don't have a substantive economic agenda for Asia. They really don't. It's, it's mostly slogans and things so far. And um, it's not a hot war in Asia. It's a game of influence and strategic leverage. And the Chinese with Belt and Road jo trying to join this CPTPP, the big trade agreement we pulled out of, they're, they're pulling out all the stops they can. And we're just doing almost nothing. And so you've, now this is pol very political. The, the, the surveys show the American public thinks trade is good. Um, you could build a coalition to do more on trade. Uh, the administration and the previous administration decided it's too radioactive, it's, it's not popular. When you talk about you know, doing the right thing, not the popular thing, uh, this may be even harder than increasing defense spending, but they've got to do it. If, if this is a moment where we realize there's evil and danger in the world, you can't just fight it with defense and diplomacy. You've got to have an economic strategy. Could I add something that you meant? Because it jumped out to me when you said it, and as I was reading the report in terms of defense spending. Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was a lot of talk about re not increasing defense spending as much. And a lot of it was driven by domestic politics in that under the Trump administration, the president would frequently say that he, this is not a political statement, but that he would say that he knew better than his generals. There was an erosion of trust after the war in Afghanistan. And you could see it reflected in the proposed budget. There were more commissions. There were more reviews. There was some discussion of cutting, or at least not increasing defense spending as much as it was because of sort of domestic political sentiment that be, the pandemic showed us that we hadn't put our national security resources where they needed to be, and maybe we needed to make a shift. It's interesting to me that in the span of 12 days, it led to a completely different shift in conversation in terms of how we yeah. think about defense spending. And, and I think it speaks to how quickly events move and how for governments that aren't necessarily as agile as, as the times we're living in, the, the challenge of sort of responding to, I think it was a, a, certainly a year plus of sentiment among some base, some, some Republican base that says we didn't want as much as defense spending. Had, had the invasion not happened, we might be talking about a completely different defense budget. And now we're talking about the need to increase it more. I think it really speaks to where the, the merge can happen between public sentiment and national security policy, but also how fickle these can be um, g given, given the worlds we're living in. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, 12 days, you said 12 days. You know, in, in 12 days, there's been this, this complete and utter turnaround. Um, this is something that we were speaking about before the, the session as well, that. We're, we're watching all of this so up close and it's moving so quickly that you see these dramatic swings. And I do wonder how long that's going to last. Like what, what will tip it back a different direction? I mean, right now we're talking about more defense spending. I'm sure that is going to be carried through into appropriations bills and authorization bills. 
Um, but as far as the American public's appetite for involvement, do you see anything that could tip the balance one way or another, either towards sustained commitment or towards a waning of attention? So I'd take Mike and I would, uh, I would start a conversation or prepare to have the conversation about the larger issues. Listen, this moment, I believe we will solve tactically. I don't know what that will be, whether that is Putin taking the land but never winning Ukraine, mm. whether that is that you're forced into some sort of engagement that escalates. I don't know, but I think it will be managed. But I would start changing the rhetoric about why we need to do things. It is so easy to be righteous during a time of ease. We've been very righteous on both sides. On energy, we're righteous. On defense, we're righteous. I think if you take that rhetoric and that righteousness and say, let's use this to say where we are, whether it is Mike's incredibly eloquent discussion about how economic security is national security, but it is a different kind of national security. Those, we need to start those. And that needs to start seeping in to the conversations and the addresses that are being had. And the leadership of Congress, if it doesn't get on board with this, will have missed an opportunity to really seize this moment, where the nation sees a moment that is showing it disquiet. Just like the pandemic showed us disquiet, if we just let it all seep away, it will come back with a vengeance because these trends are not going away. Right. I mean, Zelensky has been such a tremendous wow. leader for his people. He has been out in the streets, down with the troops, you know, gave up the suit and tie in order to put on basically fatigues, fatigues light. Um, and he has been, you know, his, he has used his, his press training, let's say, um, to great effect to really use messages that are going to resonate with his people, with leaders in Europe, and are frankly resonating quite well here in the United States. Uh, his line about, um, I don't need, am or I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. Yeah. If that's going to be one of those iconic leadership moments, I think, of, of this conflict. Um, you know, we talk about profiles in courage in the United States. Like this, this is a profile in courage. I am deeply concerned that if something happens to him, that that messaging may die off a little bit. And that if you don't have another person stepping up and continuing the drumbeat, that that too could sort of tip the balance away from you know, this, this dynamic and really compelling leader um, who's uniting the world around this cause. But it's, obviously, it's, not, it's obviously not just him, right? If it were just him, you wouldn't be having, you know, strong pockets of resistance far from Kiev. And I mean, he's, he's critical, the leader matters, but I, I, my, I think it runs deeper and broader. Um, and, uh, you know, we have been in situations before, the Vietnam War most notably, where we didn't have strong leaders, but we also didn't have strong leaders below the strong leaders. Right. So in that sense, we have a, a, a strong hand, uh, at least in terms of how we explain it to the American people, how allies look at it, and how well we're able to come together. Sure, I mean, the, the stories from across Ukraine are compelling yeah. um, and astonishing in a lot of ways. I mean, just everyday heroism. Um, I'm from a very rural part of North Carolina, and watching the farmers step up and you know steal tanks with tractors that that speaks to me in a very <laughs> deep way. Uh, so I, I completely agree; it's not just him. Um, I would hope that if he does have to go underground, or if he does have to hide for a little while, that there are other people ready to step up in a very public way um, across Ukraine and even you know inside of Europe. Um, that kind of leadership, I think, is critical to speaking to the American people. You know, you, you come out and you say, this is why you need to care about this. This is the, the fight against tyranny. Um, this is what sacrifices may be required, but also why. Well, why am I asking you to step up? Um, it's, it's leading despite the unpopularity of it. Uh, Nancy, I wanted to ask you about that leadership quality. Where have you seen this play out as a way of healing divisions? You've covered some very divided parts of the world. 
Um, where have you seen this, this work well? Oh, yeah, putting you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think where I get to see it most often is um, in watching um, commanders command and, and the battlefield. The difference between one unit and the neighboring unit is so contingent on that person and their ability to galvanize um, um, their troops and to show that they're willing to sort of be in the trenches with them. Um, I'm trying to, you know, I, I've seen that on a very micro level. And, and, and in the US military, what makes it so extraordinary is sometimes you're seeing this out of a 22 year old who's never mm -hmm. left his hometown, mm -hmm. who's being asked in some rural part of Afghanistan to lead other 18, 19 year olds um, into battle and to, to be inspiring. Uh, and motivational to them. So that's, that's in the course of my work where I get to see it the most often and in the most sort of um, intimate way because I'm often there with them and you're in that Humvee with them day after day feeling the same fear that they're feeling when they cross the wire. So I, I think that's always been the most extraordinary thing and some of it is the training they get and some of it is just really innate um, talent that they have. Um, and, and like Zelensky, I think the ones who've been the most effective speak the clearest, um, are in the fight with them, and that there's a real um, sincere sentiment behind what they're telling their, their troops. Uh, and, and I think that's been the connective thread. That, that's what struck me about Zelensky. He operates not in my head when I think of sort of a, a president and this, you think of someone, you know, leading great speeches, he's doing that, but he reminds me more of um, uh, an army captain um, leading, leading a unit in terms of trying to motivate and, um, and, and going out on the streets with, with, with his units. I mean, the worst commanders I've ever seen are the ones who sort of um, stay on base, don't go out with um, their, their troops, don't understand what they're asking of them, um, and, and, and and don't believe in the cause. And I think what makes Zelensky compelling, other than all the obvious reasons, is that as a leader, he has all those necessary skills to not only bring the Ukrainians along, but I think the, the, the international community. What, what, one of the things I think in terms of s this news event is, um, it's one of the few world events that I've covered, I guess Arab Spring would be the closest, where there's sort of an international agreement that, of who's right and who's wrong. The idea of somebody invading another country that did nothing to them, despite the historical ties, is something, I mean, we all have children who, who I mean, I, I go home to children who understand that dynamic, who are outraged by that dynamic, and he's been able to personify that in the tone and tenor, I, I think, of his leadership. At least that's how I think I've experienced it, how my readers have experienced it, and what I hear from, from even my own family members watching events unfold. Don't you think of one of the other elements is just the strength he projects where when he speaks and he, and he tacitly criticizes the United States, right? So you know he knows who his biggest ally is. But he's unwilling to, because he also understands when he's unwilling to just pander to that moment. And I think there's something compelling about people who understand their responsibility the moment they're in and do have a line where they won't just to capitulate to anything in order to get a vote or to get through. I mean, I think I mean he, yeah, he's really challenged the international right. community, right? This is democracy under attack, he's right. saying. He's saying this is a, this is a threat to, to, a very, to the very principle of countries like the United States. And you're saying the United States that this isn't worth committing your forces to. How do you reconcile that gap? If it's such a big threat, why won't you do more? He's challenging the international community to that, yeah. to answer that question. Yeah. I also love when he speaks directly to the Russian people. He speaks yep. in Russian. Yep. He says, I don't know what this denazification thing is, where here I am, a Russian-speaking Jew as the president of Ukraine, and you're telling me what exactly? Um, it's very compelling. Uh, the, the contrast of his leadership style and Putin's leadership has been stark. I think it was uh, Senator Romney the other day who had a really great line about how you see Zelensky you know, with his men in the thick of it, in the trenches, and then you see Putin in this marble room at this huge, long table, so incredibly distant from uh, his advisors. He said, 
it looks like a mausoleum where freedom goes to die. <laughs> you know, but you know, where, you know where Vladimir Putin looks pretty good right now? Where? And who he looks good to? 1.4 billion Chinese. Because yeah. Chinese media has essentially, social media, Global Times, you know, state media has essentially replayed the Russian narrative mm. yep. um, and has cens censored any, um, any uh, 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 narrative in favor of Zelensky. And when it sometimes gets through, it's immediately attacked as fake news. And so there are large parts of the world who are buying it. Who are buying it. Um, and uh, this is not something that Chinese scholars or diplomats really believe, but it's, it's, so there are parts of the world where the narrative is being controlled in ways that help Putin, because I believe this is debated among China experts, I believe Xi, Xi Jinping is essentially all in for Putin. He cannot let him fail. He will not, he, she will not trigger secondary sanctions, will not put Chinese banks at major risk. But China's already defying UN Security Council resolutions on North Korea sanctions, allowing um, shipments of coal and fuel and other things. Um, and I read that in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty safe bet that you will see significant backfilling from Beijing. And the tell uh, is this narrative inside China that the government's uh, pushing. So this, you know, we're doing great where there's free media, but there's large parts of the world where, where we're not breaking through. Right. Something we need to work on. Great. Grace. Hi. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you to the panelists for having a great discussion. Um, a question I had, and I was wondering if GSF had only waited a couple more months. What we've okay. seen is that there's been incredible support from both uh, Operation Allies Welcome with Afghanistan, and now we're seeing incredible support with Ukraine. Um, so what are some lessons that we can learn from both of these operations that has brought together the American public that we could use for a future scenario? Um, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's uh, the Bab el Mandeb Strait. Um, so just curious, opening up to the whole panel. Thank you. Well, I'll start because I just came from Taipei and saw President Tsai Ing-wen, and she is studying Zelensky. And she's thinking through, and I think is effectively finding ways to communicate uh, in the way Zelensky does, to unify a, a, a population on Taiwan that is divided on some of these questions, to unify the international community. Um, and, um, you know, she's, she's, part of that, by the way, is being inspiring, but part of it is not being provocative <laughs> and, and being steady and reliable. Um, so there is a lesson for, for, for Taiwan. It, President Tsai is clearly internalizing it and is trying to shape, I think effectively shaping narratives not only on Taiwan but, but internationally. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, as we deal with, with um, look, there are other places in the world that are under threat from large autocracies, and we ought to be thinking how we work with some of those countries and get some of these lessons in about um, how do you spend your defense dollars or, or yen or yuan? You know, do you spend it uh, on big shiny jets and missiles or do you spend it a little bit on civil defense? and things like that. You know, how do you think about your narrative? How do you think about relations uh, with other countries in the world? It may be that you know, it's the US and a few other US allies with high-end capabilities that come to your help militarily, but there are a lot of powerful co economies in the world that can be your friend in a crisis. So I think there are very, very big lessons, not just for Taiwan, for India, for other countries that are under pressure from big, powerful autocracies in their neighborhood. Ladies? No? Okay. Dr. Jones. Thanks. Uh, this has been a great panel. Uh, I have a question, uh, probably first to Mike uh, and anybody else who wants to weigh in on it. We, we, we've had important moments over the past 100 years or so which have kind of reshaped how the U.S. both domestically and as a government as well as internationally with allies and partners have restructured and rethought of themselves. There's certainly the post-World War II period where we developed alliance structures and, you know, economic uh, arrangements. Uh, there's the post-9-11 period where we created, and we can argue about the effectiveness of some of these, but we created a Department of Homeland Security. We create, created a National Counterterrorism Center. We restructured how, how important these efforts were. So is this that kind of moment? And, and even if not, what, how, you know, we've spent a lot of time in the US 
And we've heard voices over the last couple of years saying NATO doesn't matter anymore, you know, alliances and partners, it's, let's have a transactional relationship as opposed to a multilateral one. So what, how, how do we use an event like this to start to restructure our, we're not, we're not really well structured to compete with some of the states. We don't really have a lot of, haven't poured a lot of resources into public diplomacy or the information campaign. We don't have a US information agency we did during the Cold War. We don't have a clear alliance structure yet in, in, in the Asia Pacific. Does look like we're gonna take our NATO alliances more seriously now and now we're hearing from European states about increasing their percentage of GDP that they're willing to, sh to, to, to spend on defense. So I, the big question for Mike to begin with is, 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 is this that kind of moment or are we approaching it where we can start to really think about how we structure ourselves, both domestically as a, as a government and, and then internationally uh, to deal with competition here? So on the inner, that's a small question, Seth. Thank you. <laughs> on the, That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> on the international side, uh, we have a, a moment, an opportunity, and a, and a requirement. We're not going to create a global NATO. It's, it, Russia and China are different. Uh, threat perception varies. Even vis-a-vis -vis China in Asia, threat perception varies. It's a major, major trading partner. So we're not going to create a, a NATO on a global scale. But we would be fools not to create the kind of connections from NATO to the US-Japan alliance to the Quad with India, Australia. We'd be foolish to not create a lot more connectivity around very specific issues of security, um, which would include um, technology competition. It would include how we stop foreign interference. It would include how do we work together to, to develop a toolkit, which we don't have now, to deal with um, situations, for example, where we're asking allies to cut off Nord Stream or asking the Japanese to cut off their Sakhalin gas and oil. How do we, as a, as a global um, group of democratic allies, create the mechanisms to backfill quickly when we're asking one of our members to cut off a, a, a state like this, like Russia? Um, how do we help each other defend against boycotts like China's doing against Australia or Lithuania right now? So there's a very robust agenda for security cooperation using technology, economic tools, stopping foreign interference, that doesn't require a treaty ratified by Senate, but it requires very active linking of alliances around the world. And some of this is happening already. Um, the other thing is domestically, um, you know, we have a lot, I think the theme here is there's a lot more unity than not, and even more. There's one place where I'm not as confident about our national unity, and maybe this is unfair, but, but we have a national crisis, a moment when we need to think about how we apply our resources, and the answer is, the Army says, yeah, look at what's happening. We need more tanks and artillery. And the Marine Corps says, yeah, look at what's happening. We need more deployable small assets. You know, We need all those surface-to-surface -surface missiles and stingers for the Pacific. And you have the Air Force and Navy. So I don't hear out of the services unity of effort. What I, what I think I see is you know, the services seeing this crisis and making the case for their own mission. And. Um, I think that the administration uh, needs, to, needs to impose some discipline. Um, it sort of gets back to what we were saying earlier about this being a moment for the president to say we, we need, the, the, the country needs to step up. It's about defense spending, it's about economic policy, but it's also about disciplining, you know, not just how much we spend, but how we spend it and how we prioritize missions. Because I may, this may be unfair, but I sense that unity is not there right now among the services. Um, I'm sure the Joint Chiefs will send me an email yeah, tomorrow complaining, but <laughs> I, I think it's not where it needs to be. The only thing I'd add, Seth, is I think um, first thing is we have to really embrace that we're competing, that we don't just have every advantage that we have to, some of our investment has to be not just protecting, but actually investing in, in those things that allowed us to be so advantageous over the past years. And the second thing is, this technology thing, if we don't have a commerce department that is able to have a real voice in technology development, technology policy, and the only real voice is the defense department, we will not get that balance yeah. you need to between 
uh, military security and economic security that are the two elements of national security. So that's the other thing I'd say is we really need to buff up domestically our ability to really have a view of what our technology policy should be, and it can't be just limited to defense. And, and if I can just jump in, I think the Biden administration and Secretary Raimundo has someone who could do that. The Commerce Secretary is not always strategic, but he has a very strategic mm -hmm. Commerce Secretary right now. And running a state is pretty good practice for doing things. Amen to that. I would add cybersecurity as well. I mean, yep. every time there's a new, new shiny object in the federal government, they want to create a department of or an agency for. And this is one of those, I think, that instead of creating an agency for cybersecurity, just like you would never create an agency for front door security, what you really need to do is just embed this in the DNA of the federal government. And that's what I really see the, the Office of the National Cyber Director and, yep. and Ann and Jen really trying to do. It's a really it good team. Very well. Captain McSorley. Uh, taking your comments about uh, unity and then also going back, uh, Emily, when you were talking about sacrifice. I mean, that's something that's a little bit difficult for the, for the public sector and the public sphere in America. So how do leaders communicate that need for sacrifice and then generate the groundswell support to move forward so that it doesn't just turn into a Twitter war of complaints against each other? Speaking of easy questions. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any magic bullet here. I think um, yeah, my leadership trick is when you're in conflict, you go to a higher level that everyone can agree on, and then you find the specifics under the higher level. The problem is when we ask someone to sacrifice right now is we're asking them to sacrifice what you do for what I want to do. And so I think the conversation needs to be very clearly around the reason that the sacrifice is necessary. And then the sacrifices need to be proportionate to the outcome you expect, right? Because if we are in a time of mistrust, if we just hear something that sounds like the policy of one party or another, we will presume that it's just using the crisis for that moment. So I think we're gonna have to be a little cleverer about raising it up and then talking how the sacrifice yields outcome, not just the sacrifice is something you're gonna to have to give, but I make no promise of its effectiveness. That's absolutely crucial. In so much of this, the line between the sacrifice and the outcome is twisty and long and difficult to explain. Yeah, it's scary to put your name on an outcome. It is very scary. But kind of what we need to start doing. Yeah. I mean, there is a, a huge element of humility there, right? Like, this is about something bigger than me. So I can put my name on this in service of the bigger goal. It's not about whether, you know, my name attached to this particular policy fails. It's about is this good for the long-term future of the country? Well, I think that's what Nancy was saying when she was talking about the willingness of people to stand by their words. If they understood that it wasn't Sue Gordon who's saying something, but it's Sue Gordon, whatever position I represent, I am much more willing to both be true in that and willing to do it because it's not me personally, it is a position I hold. And I'll steal really quickly a Madeleine Albright story that I think if you want to know how powerful this is. She tells this very well about when she was going to her first UN Security Council meeting and she was nervous about it. And she was walking in the room and she was thinking, where are they going to like her? How is she going to get along? She's new. Until the moment that she saw her name play the United States and then she was different, different because she knew who she was and she knew the responsibility she carried. So I think that there's a little bit of that and I think that's what you were saying mm -hmm. so eloquently about why if people would put their name on it, it would carry more weight because it, it wouldn't be about the human, it would be about the responsibility. That's, it. that's true. Please. Um, thank you so much for your uh, thoughts that you have shared. My question pertains to your thoughts on um, about the response of media and world leaders towards the crisis in Ukraine as compared to whatever has been happening or has happened in the past in, say, for example, Tigray or Yemen or Myanmar. So in such situations, the response has been very different from what, as observed, is observed in, um, say, Ukraine. There can be two possibilities for that. Either it's because of Russia and the nuclear arsenal they hold and the threat that um, is imposed. And secondly, there could be racial or um, 
xenophobic undertones to this. So what would be your thoughts about that? I mean, the truth is it's both, right? It is both. Um, it is both. There's no other way for me to say it. It's both. It's, um, it's a compelling story. It's a story about a country a lot of people in this country have a connection to. Um, I think we've seen it in some of the coverage, frankly, when people talk about Ukraine is more developed or more sophisticated than um, Afghanistan or Iraq or Yemen. Um, and just anecdotally, in newsrooms everywhere, there are Russian and Ukrainian speakers. There, wasn't, there weren't Arabic speakers. Mm -hmm. There weren't, there weren't uh, Dari speakers. There, so um, I, I do think there's, there's both of those elements of it. Um, and it's something I wrestle with personally because having spent so much of my career covering Iraq and Afghanistan and the conflicts in the Middle East, it is sometimes startling to me to see so much interest. On one hand, I think it's, it's wonderful and justified. It's also heartbreaking to know that it wasn't um, equally distributed. I'll say this, also say that that inability to treat these conflicts this way, I think almost contributed to us being here. You know, Vladimir Putin didn't just start to show his mm. ways in the last month or 12 days. This was something that was building up over two decades in parts of the region that we didn't give as much attention to, like Syria, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I do think the inability to look at this as a conflict and say, well, it's just happening there, name the country, has actually contributed to our misunderstanding and miscalculation and, and, and why I think so many are surprised by something that actually in some ways had been, had been sh coming together in the past two decades in other parts of the region that we didn't pay as much attention to for, our re for access and our own prejudices. Can I jump in though? I, I agree with that, but I think also, I worked on Afghanistan when I was, on the, when I was in the administration, and um, I think there is another important difference, which is for the American public, the question was, could we help build a democracy in Afghanistan? And the answer appeared to be no. Whereas we're talking about a, a democracy being attacked by an autocracy, right? So it's, it's different in that sense. And um, I, I think, personally, I think this is a time to look back at how we're, you know, Congress is throwing robust support for helping Ukrainians come to the United States. This is a time to look again at how many Afghans we can help get out and get to the United States too. I would make that argument very, very strongly. But I, I do think the cases are different and it's not just the racial factor. The, the, Ukraine is, in a, is not perfect, but a democracy being attacked by an autocracy. That's, that is different for the American public than a, a place where we're trying. And when I was in office, we thought we might even have a chance when we were trying to build, you know, build democracy and the public concluded it's not gonna take. So those, those are important differences, I think. Tough question and a very good one. So we have about four minutes left. Um, and I want to be sure that we turn to each of you for any closing thoughts that you might have. I think this has been a really powerful discussion about the areas of unity when we talk about foreign policy and in how you can communicate that to the American people. Um, I'm very much looking forward to Secretary Panetta and Secretary Cohen talking about this as well. I know uh, I was at the agency when uh, Secretary Panetta was the then director, Panetta. Um, and I really appreciated his leadership style, which was friendly and um, outgoing and very approachable. One of the, the moments of my agency career that I think I will remember for forever was when uh, then Director Panetta called us all into the bubble uh, to talk about the Bin Laden raid and to share with everyone the success that all of people's hard work for, for so long had, had gone into. Um, and it was one of those you know moments of unity in what was at times very challenging moments for the agency. I think that the, both of them are gonna have some compelling things to say about how to really talk to the American people about foreign policy successes, foreign policy failures, sacrifice, uh, what this means to be a part of a global interconnected community. Uh, but any closing thoughts from our panelists? Might I start with you? Well, um, you know, the, the, the reality is we now have to be able to walk in, chew gum at the same time. We're gonna to have to be able to maintain focus on Asia and Europe, and, and oh, by the way, the Middle East still, all at the same time. And I, I, I was called recently to go in and visit with someone in the administration who's senior working on Asia in one of the agencies and asked, when you were in the White House and Iraq was going on, how did you keep the focus on Asia? You know, 
And I said, the key really is knowing what your strategic goals are and then bend everything towards that. And I do think that one thing that will help us in this walking and chewing gum at the same time in Asia is that there is a consensus about what the threats are, what the opportunities are, the importance of alliances. We're not going to fight that. I don't know if that's true for the Middle East. Uh, I, I think there's much less consensus about what we should be doing in the Middle East. And if I were looking at where this will have a really uh, more complicating effect, it might be in how we deal with that part of the world. I talk to my but friends. That's sort of a segue to Nancy. <laughs> right. I talked to my friends who are working on Iran and the, the JCP, yeah. JCPOA negotiations right now. And I say, so are you happy nobody's paying attention? Yeah. Or <laughs> do you wish they were? Well, I'd love to pick up on Mike's point and say, I, I think if there's no other takeaway. It's that this, these issues are all interconnected. There is no Ukraine crisis and Middle East crisis and Asia crisis, that they're all inter, interlinked. And I think in the coming weeks and months ahead, we'll see it. I'll give you one example. We did a story um, today about um, Syrians being recruited to go to Ukraine. We're seeing Chechnyans going. We're seeing American veterans and British veterans go in. And there's a threat that what's happening in conf the conflict in Ukraine becomes sort of a, a draws in um, foreign fighters from around the world. And in the case of the Middle East, for example, we could see that as those shifts happen, as Russia moves its focus on Ukraine, as fighters go in, we could see a changing dynamic in the Middle East. We could see a Russia that actually becomes more aggressive in the Middle East, and that it goes after American forces in a way to sort of signal its um, frustration with what the U.S. is doing. And so I think as we think about these issues going forward, I think it's, it's important to understand that there is, no, there is no isolated crisis and that in the more, the more complicated world we're living in, that I think we're about to see it play out in several different ways in Ukraine. And, um, and so the onus becomes on thoughtful readers like, like you to, to have to know, you have to look at these issues, I think, in a more nuanced way. And I'm sorry for that, but I think it's the only way to try to get it some understanding of how to think about them and how to craft policy. I can't believe I have to go third. Um, <laughs> Last but not these least. These are really hard issues. We're just seeing them with incredible clarity now. So that's one. I don't think there are quick fixes. Um, don't demand one, even as you demand response. Um, second, I do think that an informed hot populace has always been our strength, but it's harder to be informed. So don't listen to anyone who tells you what to believe. Do the hard work to know what you think. There are lots of data sources out there. Three, it's almost boundaryless. It is seamless between government and the private sector and the populace. It is all related. They're all affected. And so they have to work in concert. And then. And then I think the last thing I'd say is there are people every day who would advance their interests at the expense of ours. So those who say there are real evil difficulty out there are not making it up to get some policy that's actually true. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Well, on that note of unity and foreign policy being a team sport and very difficult, thank you to our experts who were up here and sharing their wisdom. I appreciate it.
forward to what's going to be a very exciting uh, conversation. It's been very good so far, but we're going to have a real opportunity now to listen to two tr truly iconic leaders in America. I'm so grateful for that. First, let me say thank you to our friends at, at uh, Leonardo who have made this possible. They've done this now for over 10 years and have given us the opportunity to host this this event, they, they were the ones that suggested to us this topic that we're going to explore uh, in this, and you, you undoubtedly have the report, I hope you do. Um, you know, I mean, I'll say it in my blunt terms, you know, can America be a world leader if we're so busy fighting each other at home, you know? Does anybody want to follow us? <laughs> you know, with the kind of behavior we've been exhibiting over the last years, and. Uh, the rancor in our politics, you know, it's disquieting. But uh, that's why we reached out to uh, Bill Cohen and to Leon Panetta. These are our two leaders who have worked harder than anybody I know to have good relations on both sides of the aisle. And I've seen it. I've seen both of them in action. Uh, what they had to do, and it wasn't always pleasant, you know, but it was invariably the core of how they approach their stewardship in office, which is we have to have a bipartisan consensus for America on these crucial issues of national security. And I, I saw them both in action in very, very difficult circumstances where there was a lot of partisan energy in the room tearing at the issue, but they kept us together as a nation. So we called on them for this conversation. It's a very important conversation we have to have. It's a little bit artificial right now because of, of Ukraine. Because there's a kind of an artificial bipartisanship. I hope it's real. I hope that it constitutes a kind of a recovery of our shared understanding of what's important to our whole family, not just one side or the other, our whole family. And, um, you know, there are little tug marks, gosh, we've had a lot of them in recent years, but I'm hopeful, I'm, and I'm sure Suzanne's going to bring some of this out in the conversation today. Um, I think the world changed rather profoundly when Putin invaded Ukraine, because as he's alienated everybody in Europe, and so many countries around the world, he, he, you know, Xi Jinping threw his arms around Putin. And he said, we are forever together, brothers here, okay. So we are on the edge of what looks like could be a great bifurcation of the international system again. And it's going to be a great challenge. We're so fortunate to have leaders of this quality who've guided us in the past and are now going to give us good thoughts for today. So Suzanne, let me turn to you to turn this conversation uh, alive for everybody in the room. Thank you both for being here. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamry, for setting the stage for this important conversation, and, and thanks to both of you for making time to be here to have this conversation with us today. We are going to get to the issues around divisiveness that are the core of the report that, that brings this conference together today. But of course, we're going to start with what is on the forefront of everyone's mind, and that is the, this horror that is unfolding in Ukraine. And, and I, you know, I know one of the things that people are, are really thinking a lot about, and the two of you are, are well situated to, to, to talk to this, is what are some of the most likely ways that this plays out? Where, is this, where does this go from here, in the near term and in the long term? Well, you know, it's a, it's a tragic moment uh, in our history when uh, we have Putin and the Russians invade a sovereign country like the Ukraine. Uh, and watching this unfold on television and seeing the chaos and the carnage that's involved with what's happening. Um, you know, just makes us all aware of the fact that sometimes we don't learn the lessons of history very well. Uh, 
And yet, I think, as John pointed out, this is very much a pivotal moment. It's going to tell us an awful lot about what happens in the 21st century. I mean, I, I look back at the 20th century and think about what happened in World War I uh, as in many ways kind of defining what the 20th century was going to look like. And I think what's happening now could tell us a lot about the 21st century, uh, not only in terms of what happens with democracies, but what happens with autocracies as well. So this is a, a very pivotal moment. And probably the best thing apart about it is that the United States as a world leader asserted its role as world leader uh, and was able to develop a unified position with our NATO allies that really came together. And Bill knows this, uh, yeah, having dealt with uh, NATO, this is a, uh, a very diverse group of nations that are part of NATO. Uh, and going to Brussels and dealing with them uh, is not an easy task. And yet, you know, I give a tremendous amount of credit to the president for his ability to kind of pull them together uh, and really agree on a strategy that involved sanctions and involved weapons to the Ukrainians and it involved uh, reinforcing our position in NATO. And it really, what it did was what they said they would do, which is to make Putin pay a price. To make Putin pay a price for, for his aggression. And that was extremely important. Uh, and, you know, as this thing's unfolded, I think, I, you know, I have to tell you that for all of the things we did at the Defense Department looking at Russian capabilities, this thing has really made clear the weaknesses of, of the Russian military. Uh, whether it's poor training, whether it's poor leadership, whether it's poor planning, uh, I don't know all of the ingredients, uh, but the fact was they were planning within a few days to take the capital to have the government collapse and that they would be uh, rulers of, the Ukraine, of Ukraine. That was the way it was supposed to play out. And that hasn't played out. In, in large measure to the bravery and courage of Ukraine and what they've done. But it, you know, it, it tells us a lot about uh, the weaknesses that we've seen. How does it play out? I think there's one or two scenarios. One is that we've, we're squeezing Putin economically with the sanctions, making it, and these are tough sanctions because of the unity of these other countries. Tough sanctions, we're squeezing him. We are seeing Russia, Russians who are disturbed by what they are, what, what's going on in Ukraine. And the demonstrations that are taking place in Russia tell us a lot about the fact that Russians are concerned about what they see happening. And thirdly, the, the ability to provide weapons or war weapons to the Ukrainians so they could put up a hell of, of a fight and continue to put up a fight. Uh, and uh, as I said, the, the the ability to reinforce our position in NATO. It, it could put enough pressure on Putin so that at some point he decides that he's in trouble as leader of Russia and that he's got to find a way to basically resolve this, say he's, you know, he's been able to achieve the goals that they were after, uh, you know, be able to retain control of the uh, Donbass area and the other areas that they've gotten and have a Ukraine that is, uh, that is neutral, but is, is its own country uh, in the remainder. Uh, in other words, to find a way where he can say, I've achieved the goals that I was after, and I've made my point that our security is important uh, and that he's taught others a lesson. I think the world would still consider 
the fact that Putin was defeated as a result of that, but at least it's a way for him to get out with some degree of, uh, you know, of, of saying, uh, you know, I was able to achieve my goals. The second option is that he's able, you know, he goes in, turns a lot of these cities to ashes. We have a lot more refugees leaving, was able to control some of the principal cities in Ukraine, and that there is a resistance that develops there that we support that will be a very prolonged resistance. The Ukrainian people are going to continue to fight. I think what Putin understands right now is he may try to conquer Ukraine, but Ukraine cannot be conquered. It's that simple. And so we have a prolonged uh, war of resistance. And the issue then is whether at some point Russia decides, as it did in Afghanistan, to get the hell out. Uh, I think those are probably the two scenarios that I see at this point. Secretary Cohen, I'd be interested in your thoughts on how this plays out and what more could uh, the U.S. and NATO and our allies be doing to try to push this uh, to, toward an outcome that is, uh, you know, more desirable? Pardon me for looking at the camera. <laughs> I'm unaccustomed to doing that, so, but I'd like to at least address uh, everybody uh, in, the, in the group here. Um, I agree with uh, Leon, we have failed to uh, learn the lessons uh, of the past. Um, but you know, taking the long sweep of history into account, uh, I think uh, the historian Will Durant once said, if you look at the past three or 4,000 years, only 212 have been free of war. So it's uh, endemic uh, to the human species that uh, we are driven to war. And uh, I was interested also, I, I, I've read it before, but I started rereading it again, um, Donald Kagan's uh, book on the origins of war and the preservation of peace. And uh, he points out that there are three things basically that drive people to war, uh, countries to war, uh, one, uh, interest, uh, two, fear, uh, and three, honor or pride. All three things are involved here uh, as far as both the Russians are concerned and certainly the Ukrainians. Uh, the Russians have been, quote, fearful uh, that the expansion of NATO is somehow going to present a physical threat or certainly a, an economic threat uh, to their existence. Uh, they have interests which they believe uh, they should restore the sphere of influence uh, that they had uh, back in 1997 or before that time. And there's a matter of honor involved, pride. Uh, Putin now uh, says the pride of uh, Russia is involved, and so he's going to break down uh, as, as hard as he can, or come down as hard as he can. Uh, I don't know what the end uh, result is going to be here. Uh, I don't think anybody can tell us. I agree with Leon's uh, presentations about two options. Uh, the one I worry about is, uh, you know, the one kind of described in T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. Uh, I'll show you fear and a handful of dust. In this particular case, the possibility of radioactive dust. Although I don't think it'll come to that, that's the fear that he is trying to stoke uh, in, the, in the West right now. Uh, and we're seeing day by day, he has absolutely no, uh, uh, no uh, apprehension about killing as many people as possible. No matter what the hardship, whether they're young babies or old men, uh, he is prepared to simply level every city in the process until um, until we find some solution to this. I don't think it's going to be us, frankly. Uh, I think the, the Chinese, notwithstanding, they're trying to stay above the fray. I think they're one of the few countries that have the ability to intervene, at least have an intervention privately uh, with Putin, saying this is not going well. Because even uh, if Leon's second uh, option is right, that uh, there'll be a long insurgency which will be waged against uh, Russia, uh, Putin's going to say, wait a minute, you're coming in from Poland? You're coming in from Moldova? Uh, you're coming in from Hungary? Uh, I don't think so. I think this is uh, something that um, I want to uh, really up the ante as far as uh, all of those countries are concerned and then start looking at ways to attack them. And then that calls us to respond. What do we do if there's a NATO country involved? How high are we willing to go up the chain? So I, I think he, at this particular point, is, has concluded that he is 
able to survive the sanctions more than we're willing to impose them over a mid or long term. Uh, I think he has concluded we know what sacrifice is going back uh, to uh, the Second World War and before, uh, that we can bear almost anything uh, and uh, that the West will fold before we do. Uh, that uh, we are going to suffer some pain uh, in the immediate, short term, medium term, and how long will we hold on? That's a concern that I have. The positive thing that has come out of all of this, if I can say there's anything positive, is that we have seen a drift toward authoritarianism in the world. Certainly uh, with China, part, certainly part of, uh, of uh, Turkey, uh, certainly, uh, we have seen it uh, in uh, Russia, and we've even seen it in this country, in which we have drifted away from the rule of law, uh, and we're seeing a turn to the, uh, the rule of power. Uh, that has been the most dangerous development from my perspective in this country. When you lose the rule of law, then you're endorsing the law of rule. And uh, it's disappointing. We were, going, <laughs> we were going to talk about this uh, as part of the agenda, was really to talk about the absence of bipartisanship uh, today as a, uh, compared to the good old days. Uh, but uh, we're finding, to me at least, the most worrisome thing is that the American people have been less concerned about preserving the integrity of our institutions that have made us the greatest force for freedom on the planet that we have taken that for granted. Now we don't really respect the rule. We don't respect it from uh, Putin's point of view. We don't respect it uh, um, geopolitically. And we don't respect it here at home enough. And I think what Putin has done is to consolidate this as, wait a minute, this is raw political and, and, and military power being exercised against people who are only seeking freedom. And so as Leon was talking about, you've seen the consolidation of uh, all of our NATO countries, which were doubtful up until most recently. Think about it. Uh, um, we insulted the Germans. Uh, the German chancellor didn't get a chance to shake, shake the hand of our former president. Uh, he, I think, demeaned her publicly. Um, we uh, had the, pre the former president question the utility of NATO, who also expressed co uh, concerns about whether we should be in Japan whether we should be in South Korea, whether we should be in Germany. And I didn't hear an outcry coming from members of Congress on that, saying, wait a minute, we are here, we have these relationships because you have to make your friends before you need them. This is the combination of all of the democracies in the world saying we have something precious and only by staying together can we preserve that. So I, I think Putin has, I don't mean this in that way, done us a favor. He's killed thousands. He's displaced at least, I'd say, 5 million, maybe 10 million that are planning on. But what he has done is reminded us, the free world, what it's worth fighting for, and that we have to stick together in the face of authoritarianism and what that means for world uh, security and, and peace. I feel a Senate response coming on, so I'm going to cease and desist for any longer comment. I'm starting to feel like a, a senator again, so um, I'll Phil, stop here. Phil used to operate <laughs> under the five-minute rule. <laughs> well, you were in the House, so that doesn't count. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm glad that you took the time to make those uh, really important comments about this broader impact on democracy. We know that Putin has spent many, many years conveying the message, trying to convince Americans, his own population, and those around the world that democracy is weak, corrupt, and chaotic, right? And not something to be longed for, that it is irrevocably broken. And, and I think he tested the strength of democracy when he made that decision to go into Ukraine. And, and so while there will be time to look back at important lessons to be learned, as you mentioned, about things we might have done differently over the years, months, and days before, go, before the invasion of Ukraine that might have uh, changed the course of events, we can learn some lessons right now about the strength of democracies, right? Secretary Panetta, I know you've talked about um, you know, leading with our strengths as a democracy. 
the fact that we have allies instead of client states uh, that come about through lots of work, that we can operate with transparency. As a former head of CIA, very interested in your thoughts on the intelligence community's performance here and the policymakers' decisions to be as transparent as they have, to shine light into the dark corners where Putin hides his secrets, for example. Yeah. Look, I mean, I'm a believer, as Bill is, in the United States as a world leader. I think it's extremely important for the United States to play that role because of the values we have as our democracy. Uh, but the way we've been able to be a world leader is because of our military strength. Uh, we are the strongest military power on the face of the earth. Uh, our diplomacy, our ability to use our diplomacy effectively, uh, and our ability to build alliances uh, and to work with allies. Uh, we're living in a dangerous world right now. Uh, and, you know, no matter where you look, even before what happened in Ukraine, uh, the reality is, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with a, a cold, second chapter of the Cold War in Russia. We're dealing with China and the threats from China. We're dealing with North Korea. We're dealing with Iran. We're dealing with the Middle East, uh, in which there are a number of failed states that are undermining the security of that region. We're dealing with cyber war, uh, which, which has become really the battlefield for the future. Uh, and our ability to be able to have a strong defense, have strong intelligence, and have strong allies is what gives us the ability to try to confront these danger points in the world. And we had a great example of what it means when we are using that leadership in order to be able to confront an adversary like Russia. I mean, yeah, look, Russia, Putin read weakness on the part of the United States for a long time, going back probably three or four administrations. Uh, and that's why, you know, he went into Georgia. He went into Crimea. He went into Syria. He went into Libya. And he, you know, used a, a cyber war against the United States on our you know, election capabilities institutions. A very bold cyber war that's still going on. Uh, and so he, he, you know, he, he, he read weakness on the part of the United States and that he could get away with it, that exercise of power. And I think he just, you know, he looked at the United States, he looked at our polarization, uh, he looked at the messages Trump was sending out, he looked at uh, the divisions within our own country uh, and what Bill said in terms of, you know, respect for the rule of law or whether we were still, or whether we could even govern, for God's sakes, whether we could govern. And, you know, he then saw what happened in Afghanistan and said, you know, I think these, these guys are not going to draw a line on me. And we did. We did. We drew a line that had to be drawn when the United States and our allies came together. And when we used the intelligence capability to basically look at what Russia was doing, and, and I mean, normally Putin likes to operate in the dark, let's face it, he likes to operate not on the, on the public stage. But when we put all of that intelligence out on the public stage and said, this is what he's up to, this is what he's planning, these are the moves he's taking, Stuff that intelligence, you know, in the intelligence business, that's what we're supposed to do, is be able to determine that. And most of the time, when you determine that, you know, you put it into the PDB and it's classified and nobody knows about it except a few people. This was put out to the world. Great decision. A great decision because it made the world aware of what the hell they were up to. And when Putin then moved, even though you know, he kept saying, we don't, we're not going to invade, we're not going to invade, we're not going to invade, even in the face of everything that was being put out in intelligence, it showed him for the liar that he is. 
and it weakened their position that much more when they then attacked uh, and invaded Ukraine. So it was a good move uh, to be able to put out that information. It was a good move to draw the line on Putin and say that he's, got, he's gonna pay a price. He's now paying that price. And the key, I think, right now is that the United States and our NATO allies have to stick together in a more unified way than ever. Because if we're into this long-term resistance war that goes on in Ukraine, with all of the sanctions in place, with all of the economic consequences, we're gonna get some breaks that are gonna start appearing. And we cannot afford to have any breaks in the unity between the United States and our allies. We have got to remain firm. That's gonna be the key as to whether or not uh, we ultimately are going to be able to prevail one way or another in this war that we're in. We're in and we are, even though it's, I, I, we haven't declared war, the reality is for all intents and purposes, the United States is in a proxy war with Russia right now. And we have to determine who ultimately is gonna prevail. I, I think we're in two kinds of war. Number one, informational warfare and economic warfare. Uh, the fact is we tend to lump uh, the Russian people in our discussion, but the Russian people ordinarily would be with us. Uh, they have seen the benefit uh, from what is happening in the West as the Ukrainians have. And uh, Putin has shut that down now. You know, we like to uh, cite uh, Orwell, but just think about it. Uh, this is not a war. Uh, this is a special military operation. And if you call it a war, you go away for 15 years. Uh, if you criticize our military, you go away for 15 years. So he has turned this into Orwell's Ministry of Truth. And you think about it, you know, war is peace, uh, ignorance is strength, uh, slavery is freedom. Uh, it's whatever they say it is. And if you suppress the information in Russia, they're going to listen to what he's saying. So we have to wage an information warfare to penetrate the Iron Curtain that he has put up in terms of uh, uh, the Russian people understanding what's going on. I mean, think about the Russians so far. I think they've arrested at least 8,000, maybe more. People who are in the streets in Russia saying uh, they know what's going to happen. and They're going to go away. Uh, they, they'll go to the gulag. Uh, that, uh, of the past, and yet they're out there demonstrating against them. So the more the information gets out there, the more people are going to be in the street, and the more people in the street, he's going to be even more threatened. Well, that pre presents another challenge for us. What happens when he really is threatened from within? What does he do at that point? Does he lash out further? Uh, does he then get more aggressive in terms of what he is threatening to to uh, the NATO countries or in Ukraine or those that are not yet members of NATO? Uh, we don't know, which is why I think China has a big role to play here. Uh, China, they've signed their deal at the Olympics and saying we're with you, uh, hook, line, and sinker. But the Chinese don't want to see this uh, interrupt into a much more global conflict than it is right now only in Ukraine. They have a major interest in not seeing the, us come face to face uh, with the Russians and what can happen by either misjudgment, miscalculation, mistake. If one of those missiles flies into uh, Poland and takes out some American or uh, Polish soldiers, what's our reaction at that point? I think there'd be a pretty strong reaction. Then we start climbing up the ladder. But I want to come back to Leon's uh, point about hanging together. Uh, and that's one of my concerns uh, right now. I don't recognize the Congress that I served in or that you served in for you. I don't recognize the House of Representatives. I don't recognize the United States Senate. There were never cases like that when we were in office. And there are reasons for this change. Uh, neither Leon nor I ever had to confront and deal with social media. We really never had to deal with the effects of globalization. If you think about what's going on in this country, apparently they're out on the uh, uh, 95 or I-95 or 495 now, uh, demonstrating against the wearing of masks or the mandates for vaccinations. 
Uh, <laughs> even though we're taking the mask off, even though we've vaccinated most of the people, 75%, they're out there demonstrating. And they're appealing. Members of Congress, especially in my party, appealing to the, uh, the worst instincts uh, of the American people in terms of uh, fear, um, race, racism, misogyny, all the, all the things that have been in, in our lives from the beginning of time. It's just come to the surface more in the last four or five uh, years. But we have members of the Congress now saying uh, we support Putin. Well, why, didn't, why don't we support Putin? And the short answer is you believe in freedom, don't you? Uh, and that's why we're supporting the Ukrainians, because of freedom. Not that, that here you are demonstrating against mass, these people are dying. And so I worry that we won't be able to sustain the consensus that exists now because we're moving into a political year. And now we're saying, well, didn't Biden lose this war? Isn't this Biden's fault? Uh, that we lost this, and then they start in again trying to uh, really place themselves in front uh, so they can win uh, the election in November. I think Putin's counting on that. I think most authoritarian governments look at us. Most of our allies look at us, and they say, how can we be sure that you'll still be there? The reason you're seeing so much discontent in the Middle East is our allies and friends don't trust us. They don't trust us. You, you touched upon all the issues, why not? They saw how we pulled out of uh, Syria. Uh, some of you may recall that was uh, Sec SecDef General Jim Mattis, who had, he, he was forced to resign after he saw that the president said, pull out of Syria now. No notice to allies, no notice to anybody else, get out. And he felt, I can't serve anymore. And so then we're out of Afghanistan and the way that was uh, certainly initiated. They're looking at us saying that we want to get out of Iraq. So all of these countries are looking at us and saying, we're not too sure. So maybe the Saudis have to hedge. And that's why they haven't been very responsive. President Biden asked them to produce more energy. And they said, no, I don't think we're going to do that. Israelis came out finally and, and, uh, and endorsed condemning um, Russia, but they're in a conflict. They have a conflict. They've had a good relationship. They've been developing with the Russians. And I think we all know why that is in terms of having some access to go into Syria without being hit with S-400s. Uh, but they've got a conflict there and they're being torn by that. They have came out, they had a, their prime minister go and meet with, uh, with Putin and that is great. Uh, and then you've got India. India would be uh, one of the largest uh, uh, democracies in the world. Uh, they have remained reasonably silent. silent. Why? Because they depend upon Russian military. 50% or 60% of their military uh, equipment comes from uh, Russia. They've had long historical ties uh, to Russia. Here we are trying to establish a much better relationship with India, the Quad, you know, India, Japan, Australia, US. And so they're in a position now where they're trying to hedge, what do we do? We wanna maintain our neutrality or autonomy uh, and not get caught up Russia versus United States. But the fact is they look at China to see that China is posing a threat to them, economically and militarily. So it gets more complicated in terms of how we hold on to all of this solidarity. So it comes back to interests, fear, and honor. And so I, uh, I don't know how it all ends. Uh, I'm hoping for the best. I hope uh, Leon is correct, uh, that, um, that some settlement can be arrived at. But isn't it ironic? that we have to find a face-saving way out for Putin, who has created this disaster on a monumental scale, and we've got to find, how can we save face for him? Um, I find it hard for us to do that, but uh, again, I'm hoping that others will, uh, I don't think that we can. I don't think that we'll be able to do that. Uh, but I think that others who have an interest in seeing to this not spread will be helpful in this regard. How much do you think that effort to find an off-ramp, uh, the effort ultimately perhaps to, to, to negotiate some way out of the violence here, is complicated by Putin's decision to indiscriminately target civilians? Uh, the UN is now talking about war crimes investigations. Mm -hmm. How much does that complicate the way out? 
here, if, if we're going to be true to the rule of law, for example? You want me to keep that? <laughs> OK, I'll go first. I'll try to be uh, as short as I can. Uh, it does two things. The cruelty that he has demonstrated has, I think, rallied the world against him. So as Leon was saying earlier, everybody who has freedom of information can see what he has done and what that means to peace throughout the world. So it has rallied uh, the world against him. Uh, the fact that he has killed so many uh, and is prepared to displace as many as 10 million uh, people, uh, I think that makes it more difficult for a, quote, off-ramp uh, for him. Uh, on the other hand, <laughs> to the extent that he sees more and more people, the Israelis criticizing him, uh, the UAE uh, stepping in, others now criticizing, not only criticizing, you know, it's not just, not words. We can all talk words up here. The question is, what are we prepared to do? Are each of those countries prepared to cut off some degree of business with them? Uh, so that it really hurts him in a way that um, the Russian people, once again, take to the streets. So I, I think it, uh, it'll rally uh, the world opinion against him. That may make it more difficult to find off ramps, but I think the more he does this, uh, the less options he's going to have. And um, I don't know how it ends well. Uh, the, the, see, I worry about uh, waging a long-term insurrection, or I should say insurgency, uh, against him, because I think he can't afford to have that happen. He can't afford to have all of these weapons coming in from all of these different states uh, without declaring war against them as well. So uh, maybe in the short term, when, um, if other major powers step in and give him counsel, saying, uh, let's, find, let's find Leon's way out of this. This could have been done from the beginning, by the way. All of this could have been done, what Leon has suggested, from the very beginning. We could have said from the beginning that too early to be talking about uh, coming into NATO, and you were just visiting the, the CIA. Bill Burns wrote about this in his book, you know, uh, the most recent book, Back Channel, uh, in which he pointed out back in 2007, he said, this is a red line. You don't want to cross this red line because Putin will react in a very aggressive way. It was good advice then, it's good advice now, but here we are. So I think uh, it's going to take other powers other than ourselves. It's going to take other powers to help persuade him uh, he's made a big mistake and find a way that he can say, OK, I made my point. You didn't listen to me. Now you're listening to me. Uh, and that's a message to the, the rest of you who want to get into NATO and the EU. Uh, I'm still here. Look, when, when the United States and our NATO allies decided and said, that we're going to make Putin pay a price, and then made him pay a price for the invasion. Uh, it is very important that we understand that this means that we have to make him pay a price. So there isn't a nice guy approach here uh, when you're dealing with a tyrant and a bully like Putin. Uh, this isn't one where you can kind of hope that saner minds will kind of take over and, and try to provide you know, that uh, kind of uh, diplomatic solution that could happen. This is, this is a situation where having drawn the line on Putin, we have to stick to it. And we got to make damn sure that the sanctions continue to hit Russia and that uh, the Russian people are made aware of just how horrible this situation is and begin to continue to undermine his strength back home, which will get his attention a hell of a lot faster than anything else. Uh, and we have to continue to arm the Ukrainians so that they're able to to do the remarkable fighting that they're involved in. These are small groups that are, I mean, a 40-mile convoy has been held up for a long time. Why? Because they're going in and they're blowing up fuel trucks, they're blowing up other trucks as part of it, and basically stalling 
that convoy and doing a hell of a job uh, as a result. And Russians now are facing logistic problems, particularly in the South and elsewhere, in terms of their ability to supply uh, their troops. I mean, now they're supposedly going to be calling in Russian troops from Syria because, you know, they, 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 they're not, it's not going well. It's not going well. So you got, Putin is about power. And we've got to continue to exercise the power we're involved with. And yet, does it involve risk? You're damn right. This is, a, this is not only a pivotal moment, this is a dangerous moment. Because when you have that much concentration of military forces, you know, the possibility of a misjudgment or, uh, you know, somebody who decides to send a missile in the wrong direction, uh, it's, it's, it's very probable that you could have something like that happen. And we'll have to deal with the consequences. So it is, it is dangerous. And th there's no question that Putin, you know, who uh, the Russians have been working with uh, small, small yield nuclear weapons, who the hell knows? But we are in this now. And this is about democracy. This is about whether or not a sovereign country is going to survive. When Hitler went into Czechoslovakia, you know, in many ways, Europe stood back. And he continued to go. Uh, and he wasn't stopped. We've made the decision to stop Putin now. That's what it comes down to. And, you know, I think when you put him in, when, when power puts him in a difficult position, then yeah, it could go several ways. He could be cornered and strike out, or he can say, you know, my power is on the line. My ability to lead Russia is on the line. I'm losing my country. The, these body bags going back to Russia, I'm sure are contributing to the, to the same sense that what the hell are we doing there? So if it is about saving his neck, then I do think that there are ways that he'll decide that he could get away with it. China could help, of course. Others could help, perhaps. But this is Putin that's going to have to make the decision. And the only way I can see now to make him make that decision is to continue to squeeze him. And that's what we're doing. Have you noticed how far away he sits from everybody? <laughs> you know, we could land an F-35 on that desk. <laughs> there you go. And it, and it may be that um, you know he is trying to show that I'm in charge. I don't have any uh, advisors around, just me. You were saying about uh, I'm in charge. Uh, it may be that he's worried about COVID, and it may be that he's worried about something else, uh, of people getting too close to him. Whatever it is, I noticed after we started talking about this, he had all of the airline attendants uh, sitting next to him as he was explaining why they're out of job uh, for the near future. Um, I, I, listen, I'm, we are, we're in total agreement here. We're, we're not having a debate at all. Leon and I are on the, the same page on this. I still worry about this country mostly because when I see a candidate for the United States Senate say that I don't care about Ukraine one way or the other. You know, it's sort of like uh, in the past, World War II, um, where's Prague? Uh, where's, um, where's Bucharest? And for people to say they're over there, we don't care about them. It's not just about Ukraine. It's about democracy here as well. And that's why maybe we're going to get to the, this debate about how do we educate ourselves? Uh, we don't talk civilly to each other. We have entered an era of crudeness and crudity uh, and coarseness in our speech and our conduct toward each other uh, that is uncivilized. It really is, is uncivilized that we see each other as enemies, that we can't sit down and have a conversation. 
and that members of Congress now see each other as the enemy camp. Uh, and it's all about, uh, can we get back in power? To do what? You want to get back in power? To do what? Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been a strong supporter of Joe Biden. He and I went to Congress the same year. I hate to say this, 1972. Um, he went to the Senate, I went to the House, and uh, he's been a friend ever since that time. He has a good heart. Uh, he is somebody who is necessary at this point in our lives because he wants to bring us back together. And we have been really divided and, and, and rejoicing in that division. And you see what happens when you simply are divided so to the core that nothing gets done. And, you know, authoritarians love this. They love this because they can ride in on a white horse and say, look at the chaos, democracy? What have you done for yourselves lately? You can't reach an agreement. It took you a long time on infrastructure. You can't reach an agreement on, on uh, climate change. You can't reach agreement on any of these major issues. Therefore, only I can solve this. Only Putin can solve this. Only Xi Jinping can solve this. Uh, only Erdogan can solve this. So again, we've been seeing this drift, and it really is kind of uh, on the geopolitical landscape saying, what's the best principle of organization in our lives today? Is it democracy with all of its strengths but all of its weaknesses, where they can't reach decisions in a timely way? Or is it with strongmen and putting concent concentrate that power in the executive branch? So all of that power is in the executive branch, and that president, whoever it is. I just uh, wrote a piece with uh, former Senator Gary Hart, I don't know if it's gonna get published or not, on something called PIADS, Presidential Executive uh, Emergency uh, Declarations. Um, something that we don't know about because it's never shared with the public. You, never, you haven't seen it, it's all classified. Uh, and yet when you start looking, some insights have been gained to it. You start looking at what can they do with suspension of habeas corpus control of the media, arrest of individuals. All of these things can take place in the name of continuity of government. I mean, these are all things that are out there that we don't talk about enough, but it comes back to civic education. What is the reason that we have this country? What is the reason we call ourselves the United States of America when there's so much division economically, racially, religiously, culturally? Uh, and we haven't come to grips with that. You know, we talk about, well, people in this country are fearful. Here again, fear, honor, interest. People are fearful of what? Demographic change. What does that mean? It means brown people are coming into power. That's what that means. That the white world as such, that is here in this country saying, how did all of these people who are black and brown get all these positions? What are, I thought they weren't smart enough or they weren't good enough, or they were inferior. And now we see them everywhere. They've been allowed to have an education. And now they're occupying positions of power and we're losing power. Therefore, demographic change is just a word for brown people and black people are coming for your jobs. And some members of Congress and presidential candidates are preying upon that. I'm, I'm, I'm get, here we go again. I'm getting me, into the senatorial speech, so I'll stop here. Let me, but. Let me, give, you, can, let me give you some hope, okay? Uh, I, because, I mean, look, Bill and I saw Washington at its best, and I think we've seen Washington at its worst. I mean, the good news is we saw Washington work, and that there were Republicans and Democrats willing to work together, even though they had their political differences. They were willing to work together on major issues. When I got elected to Congress, Tip O'Neill was the speaker, Democrats, Democrat from Massachusetts, but he had a great relationship with Bob Michael. He's an old Republican, don't let him forget that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and Bob Michael was uh, you know, from Illinois, and they had, they had their political differences, but they were friends, and they made the decision that when it came to major issues, no matter who was president, they were gonna work together to solve those issues. And I was there at the time and I you know, was part of that process. Uh, and there's no question that uh, of late, uh, we're extremely polarized and it does, our inability to govern is a national security issue. Right. Uh, and it is extremely important that we understand that 
purpose of getting elected is to govern. It isn't just to pound your shoe on the table uh, and engage in politics. Now, I, I don't, I'm not sure this is going to change from the top down. I tell the students at the Panetta Institute, we govern either by leadership or by crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, we can avoid crisis. If not, we'll govern by crisis. And of late, we've largely governed by crisis. I mean, the budget's the best example of that. You know, it, we're still working on a damn CR. Yeah. Uh, and it's likely we'll get another CR in order to get, get by it. So rather than dealing with it, they're dealing with it through crisis. Now, ultimately, I really do think that although this may not change from the top down, that it will change from the bottom up because there are a lot of people who are getting elected, uh, and I can say that because my son uh, is a member of Congress. Uh, there are those who have gotten elected, particularly those who have been in the military, who say, I'm not going to Washington just to play a political game. I'm going to Washington because I want to govern. And so there's things like the Solutions Caucus uh, in the House, 25 Democrats, 25 Republicans, willing to work together on issues. It's a start. And they're, and they're having an impact. And there are moderate members uh, on the Senate side who are interested in governing as well. I think this event that we're in with regards to what's happened in Ukraine could very well be, and I, I wish the, the president had stressed this, the unity we're showing in Ukraine ought to be the kind of unity we need to build back home. Uh, and we can do that. Why? Because I still believe very much in the spirit of the American people. That really is the fundamental strength of our country. It doesn't lie here in Washington. It lies in the spirit of the American people. And they care about their family. They care about giving their kids an education. They do care about the rule of law. They do care about trying to be able to get a decent house and take care of their parents. Uh, with health care. Those are common issues. And we can build on that. But my hope is that what's happening today, and it has produced some bipartisanship, at least on that issue, but that it could become hopefully a turning point to begin to focus on other issues that, uh, that we need to unify on. And, you know, Donald Trump has become a hell of a lot more isolated as a result of the stupid things he's saying. And that gives me some hope that perhaps, you know, we're going to be able to see new leadership come to the Republican Party, and hopefully new and younger leadership be a part of the Democratic Party as well. There is hope here, but we have to work at it. It's not going to happen by itself. I ask unanimous consent that I be allowed to associate myself with remarks made by, <laughs> by, by the gentleman from California <laughs> and, and his son, who we take great hope. <laughs> well, and, and I, I am thrilled uh, at both of your remarks just now, both in terms of sharing with us that sense of hope but also in, in pushing for civic education and a rediscovery of our shared values. It's an issue very near and dear to my heart that we've been working on for the last several years here at CSIS. And, uh, and I will say it is also a sign of hope. Uh, Frank Lutz who, Lutz, who is a Republican pollster, um, did a, took a survey, a poll, and it was one of the only polls I've, I've seen in the last several years uh, where there were an equal number of Democrats and Republicans who agreed on one thing, and that is that the best way to restore a sense of national identity is to teach civics education. Yeah. And that nearly 60% identical percentage of Republicans and Democrats. So despite efforts by some to pull the reinvigoration of civics into the culture war, my sense is that there is bipartisan support for this and something we can move forward on. So uh, on that optimistic note, I'm going to turn it over for questions. I'm sure that folks in the audience have some questions. I hope you do. If you don't, we'll keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, uh, thank you guys for having such a great discussion. I'd like to ask about how we can maintain the integrity of institutions without a crisis, because we've seen, as you guys referenced, that NATO's really strong because we're in a crisis, but that's not really a sustainable solution. Well, go ahead. One thing we have to do is to restore uh, respect for our institutions. Uh, some Many years ago, there was a book, a book written by John Gardner called The Recovery of Confidence. It was one of my favorite little books in which he talked about the need for us to restore a sense of confidence and our ability to govern. And that means respecting the institutions and what they stand for. Uh, again, I'm trying not, trying not very hard to not make this partisan in nature. Uh, but when the former president came into office, uh, the first thing he said is, I want my judges. I want my generals, I want my, my State Department, I want my military. Um, and so what it was is to take away the, the reverence for the independence of the institutions. You know, they, they pay, they're all a political role in that sense, but they basically have been uh, constructed in a way that you have, you have respect for it, including the Supreme Court in years past. Uh, today, the Supreme Court is seen more as being a partisan institution which will reduce respect for the institution. You know, I wish to say, you know, I disagree with that decision. It's 5-4, it's 6-3, but it's the Supreme Court. Uh, I accept what they've done. Today, I don't think that people feel the same way, that they respect the way, because it's seen as being purely political and, and partisan in that nature. So I think as part of our civic education, we have to get back to saying no. Uh, Mr. President, this is not your military. This is not your Justice Department. This is not your Attorney General. We have to go back to saying these institutions have been created so that the majority of the American people can really enjoy the benefits of freedom, ability uh, to prosper, uh, and uh, to make contributions to society. I think unless we do that, we're going to be back to a power game, uh, and we are all going to fail as a result of it. Uh, I, I do share uh, Leon Panetta's sense of optimism that we can do this. And his spirit uh, is something, I mean, he's been running an institute out in California where he's talking to uh, young people like you all the time. And basically that's, uh, that's something that we have to depend upon you, asking questions of, of people who are running for office at the local level, state level, and federal level. Look, uh, democracy. <laughs> Democracy, you know, is, has, has never been easy because it is government of, by, and for the people. And for people bring their different viewpoints, their different sense of values, their different sense of, you know, what's, what's right about our, our country. They always, they bring that to the table and the ability to kind of be able to have that exchange and then to be able to find consensus or find compromise is at the heart of what our democracy is all about. Uh, and that leadership to do that means you have to be willing to take risks. You have to take risks, which means that, you know, there are going to be times you're going to decide something that could very well wind up losing your election. That's, that's a fact. Uh, and, and yet, you make the right decision because it's right for the country. And that, we have to get back to that attitude that you're not elected to come back here in order to develop a career job in which you'll never leave. These jobs in Washington, you know, are jobs where you come back, you do your very best, you make the right decisions, and yeah, you may, you may lose your next election. There's nothing wrong with that. That's why you're elected, to come back here to govern, to make tough decisions. And, you know, I, I was elected in, in what was a Republican district, uh, and I'll never forget, first time I came back, Tip O'Neill said that the first vote I had to do uh, was a vote for a pay raise. 
And I said, I can't do that. I just got elected. It's, and the economy was not doing well. I said, the last damn thing I'm going to do is to vote to give myself a pay raise. And Tip, in it, you know, his Irish <laughs> approach said basically, ah, don't worry about it. Nobody ever has lost their election because of a vote on a pay raise. And I said, I can't do that. I can't go back to my constituents, stare them in the face, and say I've just given myself a big pay raise when they're having a hell of a time surviving every day. So I voted against the pay raise. And you know when the, and it passed, and instead of taking the pay raise, I gave it back to the Treasury. I wrote a check to the Treasury. It was the best campaign ad <laughs> I ever had <laughs> in my reelection. Uh, you have to make those kinds of decisions. And I, I, I think somehow we've got to get back to that, because the whole rule in politics these days is don't make those tough decisions. The leadership sometimes don't make those tough decisions. It may offend our base. That's not what it's about. The issue is, is it the right thing to do for the country? And I have to say, the leadership that was in the Senate, the leadership that was in the House, made decisions based on what they thought was in the best interest of the country. That's what we have to get back to. We've got to get back to that mentality. Because if, it's just, if you're just getting elected to come back here to worry about saving your seat, don't, don't bother. Don't bother. Come back here to govern to make tough decisions, and, and, to, and yes, you take the consequences. But that is what democracy is all about. And it's those signs of, of courage that are what, what will make our democracy strong. It isn't about saving each other in a political campaign. It's about the decisions we make. I had a very different relationship with Tip O'Neill. <laughs> when I stepped onto the House floor, he gave me a note to take to Carl Albert. He thought I was a page. That's all right. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you talked a little bit about the distinction between um, bottom-up versus top-down solutions, and how in, in America and democracy, we really emphasize you know, bottom-up, very to Tocquevillian view that um, I sympathize a lot with and I think is very important. But do you think there are sort of top-down changes, practical changes that can be made that would actually be effective. Because what concerns me is just the way that certain institutions function, they reinforce polarization from the top down that reverberates across society. So it's from the bottom up, but it also is coming from the top. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective on various tweaks that have been proposed, such as you know open primaries, um, the, the filibuster, for example, um, mixed member majoritarian, all these other different things that, that proponents say would reinforce the right kinds of norms we're looking for. Thank you. I'll try to make this as short as I can. <laughs> um, there are things that can be done. I think Joe Biden is trying to do those. He's trying to say, come back together so we can reach an agreement, that we can pass legislation that will do what? That will benefit people's lives. We're going to change your life for the better. Government has a role to do this. Republicans and Democrats can disagree about the role of government in our lives. Democrats are always going to believe that government can take a more aggressive uh, role in helping to alleviate poverty and all of the disparities that exist in our society. Uh, Republicans will always say we want fiscal responsibility, balanced budgets, and less government involved in our lives. But there is a, and there always has been, if you look back in the history that we were there, there were always Republican and Democrats who could agree. Uh, Bob Dole, conservative as they come, could reach an agreement with George Mitchell, as liberal as they come. Bob Michael, uh, that you mentioned before, Bob Michael could reach an agreement with Tip O'Neill even though they had fundamentally different uh, uh, philosophical positions. So we can do, we have to show that government can work. And I, and I touched upon this just briefly and it was a collateral issue, but it's not collateral in the lives of uh, most people. 
um, globalization has done great things for billions of people on the planet. It has also created great disparities here in this country. And I don't think we, who were in office, myself included, were cared enough about what the impact would be if we simply outsourced jobs to China. In other words, we didn't think about the consequences. Yeah, these great companies, they can make a profit by investing or doing business in a, a low-cost country. They can produce all these uh, lower-cost items much cheaper, and therefore we can generate prosperity, et cetera. We really didn't think the con through the consequences. What does it mean when Detroit no longer exists as a, as a manufacturer of cars? Uh, when you don't have all of these centers who have jobs? Because the anger you see out there right now is for people who feel that we didn't really care about them. That we, the elite, um, the snobs here in Washington, New York, the major cities, really look down our noses at those who are at the working level who no longer have hope. And that has been one of the causes that we've seen with people rising up now saying, we trust uh, uh, Mr. Trump because he speaks for us. And so what we have to do is show that government really is an instrument for helping to produce prosperity. And so we have to enlarge the prosperity. And we have to have a way, whether it's uh, uh, Ray Dallow of, uh, of uh, CSIS, who's a member of the Board of Trustees, who said, well, capitalism as it is may not be able to survive, not survive, but prosper, unless we make some changes. So how do you make changes in capitalism without being accused of being socialist? So we, <laughs> we've got those things that we have to, again, educate ourselves. What kind of changes can be made in the capitalist system that takes into account the great disparity in wealth in our country. As John Kennedy once said, you know, if we cannot help the many, the millions who are poor, we can't save the few who are rich. Well, that disparity is getting greater and greater. And what does that mean for the people who have to live with that disparity? They get angry. They take to the streets. They're driving around the beltways. So we have to do things at the governmental level to show that we really can work these things out. And when we do that, you'll have less anger. Uh, less uh, self-interest as such, more of a general interest in the, the greater common weal, the greater wealth of the community. You know, I, look, the, there, there's no question reforms can be made. And those reforms might, you know, might provide some improvement. But I have to tell you, from my experience both on Capitol Hill and in the administration, that it is the quality of humans in those jobs mm -hmm. that makes the difference. And you know, I, I found when I was in the administration, there's always the idea, well, you know, we need to reorganize the department or we need to move the boxes around. Moving the boxes around didn't do a damn thing. Why? Because you had the same people that were there as part of the boxes. And they didn't do a damn thing. They just moved stuff from the inbox to the outbox. And so, you know, the lesson I learned, particularly in, in the administration, and particularly as chief of staff, was that if the president wanted something done, I had to find the right person who could cut through all the BS and get it done. And if I, if I found somebody who had that leadership ability and that was willing to do that, that's how you got it done. And I have to tell you, same thing's true in the Congress. The, the, the quality of people, you know, and you can reform things in Congress as well, I understand that. But it's the quality of people who are elected and whether they really care about what their job is about and that they're there to try to solve problems, not to, not to try to stop the other party or create a conflict. They're there to stop it. And we had some, some decent members who were willing to do that from both sides of the aisle. That's why, you know, Bill and I come from an era where Republicans and Democrats were, in fact, working together to get things done. And, and it, you know, it, it wasn't because the rules told them to do that. 
It's because there were good people getting elected. Elections have consequences. You know, if the American people are going to elect poor representation, there isn't a damn thing we can do about the ultimate impact here in Washington. It's going to be lousy. If they, in fact, elect people that really do bring the right qualities to the job, then that's how you make our democracy function. So, you know, we've got to get that message back to the American people. The ultimate check in our democracy is the right to vote. And that's going to tell you what kind of democracy you have or you don't have. Thank so you. the quality of people in government, uh, critically important. The quality of people engaged in civic conversation outside of government, equally important. And I feel more confident about the state of our democracy, knowing that the two of you have continued to be engaged uh, as, a, as very quality voices in our civic conversations, whether it's with conversations with young people um, making time to come and have a conversation at a forum like this, uh, you know, being on television, talking about the strength of democracy and the importance of our shared values. So I am so grateful to both of you, not Thank only you. for being with us here today, but for your continued engagement in helping steer us. We, we are, as Dr. Hamry said, uh, in a time of perhaps fundamental shift in our world and how we steer our way through it. Uh, needs to be informed by wise and experienced voices like yours. So thank you very That's much. That's the most Please graceful get the hook that I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could go on all afternoon. We can't. Thank you but very thank much. You. <laughs>